Greetings, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to a very special Tranya fueled star studded <laughs> episode of Monster Party. Monster Party! Monster Party! All right, so, uh, oh my god. We got to get to it. And, yes. Yes, and, and who are you, sir? I am Matt Weinhold. I am Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Strofe. And I'm James Gonis. Mm. And this topic is a very special topic, one we've been wanting to do for maybe the entire time that we've been doing this show. Yeah, that's, that's true. Very, please introduce the topic and our guest. Well, I'll tell you, Matt. Uh, our guest has been active in the entertainment industry for nearly six decades. With over 250 credits to his name, tonight's guest has been in a slew of television shows such as classic Star Trek, Night Gallery, the latest incarnation of The Outer Limits, feature films like Evil Speak, The Wraith, Apollo 13, Carnosaur, The Ice Cream Man, Solo, A Star Wars Story. He's been in numerous short films and he's had his own variety show. Listeners, please put your hands together and welcome to Monster Party, the amazing Clint Howard! <laughs> Welcome. And oh, God, you have no idea how long we've been wanting this to happen. Yes. yes. We are so honored to have you here. Yes. Well, you know, I really appreciate it. And before we go any further, after watching your opening, I must say you guys are certifiably psychotically <laughs> schizophrenically nuts. Uh, now, we have some serious issues. <laughs> yes. Oh, my and God. I this have is how we deal issues. with it. I have some tissues for your issue. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is a party. <laughs> yes. So, so, Clint, I have to ask. I mean, uh, I was thrilled to have met you about five years ago. You, you did a Playboy radio show, and I was able to meet you. And I, I mentioned Monster Party. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, give me a, give me a little, you know, hook me up here. And, and so it's taken this long, but we are so thrilled <laughs> to finally have you. Yes. Now that we've yeah. trapped you in your home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, now, for listeners, we're still under the quarantine thing. That's yes. still happening. Yeah. Uh, so but, you sprung this quarantine just to get me to stay at home so you could do an hey. interview with me? Hey, we will go to any lengths. <laughs> we, we, we know a lot of really important viruses. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Now, Clint, I know you, you've been doing this for a long time. I mentioned nearly six decades. I mean, how did you, how did you get into the whole acting thing when you were, you were a peanut, basically? <laughs> well, you know, my brother, Ron Howard, um, you know, he was on the Andy Griffith show. And I was two years old at the time when they were doing the first season of the Andy Griffith show. And it literally was a kind of a circumstance that um, mom was having to watch Ron on the set. I believe dad had some sort of acting job or something that he would go off and do. I mean, dad was always the one with us on the set. I mean, right, was, right. Ron and I never had a paid guardian or babysitter or anything. It was always either dad or mom. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if dad still was attempting and was successfully working as a, you know, as a character actor and, and, and yeah. going around doing writing and things like that. Uh, so one day on that first season, dad, was not there and mom had to watch Ron and brought me along and I had a little cowboy outfit on two little six shooter toy guns and you know <laughs> a big bandana and Bob Sweeney the director immediately I mean of course I have no memory of this but I was told and, and <laughs> over time I know it's true that he just he instantly thought of a wonderful bit that he could do mm -hmm. and it, it was a it was a joke it, it literally was a silent joke with this little kid and from that it was successful and, and then I ended up doing five or five more episodes of the Andy Griffith show over the course of a couple of years as playing this character Leon yeah, and he had you in a party. He had you in a party scene, right? That first thing it was like a party scene and stuff. It was and, like a big barn dance. It yeah. was a big square right. dance, and they panned the audience, and they showed me, and I was literally leaning up against the door jam, and my hand was not even going to the lock. You know, I mean, yeah. I was really tiny, and I was smiling, yeah. and I was enjoying the dance, and it seemed like that the Mayberry women and the Mayberry men were going to get along, and then the joke was a parent or someone came by and 
covered my eyes and scooped me up. Like, this was too racy. Uh, oh. Andy Griffith show? <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. And it buttoned, it buttoned out the episode. Um, you know, I don't know who invented the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with, with Don Knotts with Barney. Uh-huh. There were a couple of great instances where, you know, I got to hold up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then Don did some shtick. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> wow. And, so th- and then... Yeah, again, I have no memory of this. My memory right. started when I was about five years old sure. uh, as far as being able to remember being on movie sets and stuff or television sets. But it's obvious that when, when, this, when the business finds a kid who mm-hmm. is natural, not intimidated, not scared by the camera. I mean, listen, right. yeah. I mean, most kids will just scare yeah. <laughs> right, right. right. You know, I mean, many directors back then, I remember many directors calling the children to the set and saying, now look at the camera. Now mm-hmm. take a good look at it because it's not doing anything and you don't have to look at it when we're filming. I want you to look at it now, you know? Right. And I was thinking that was pretty silly because I kind of got it. Right. Right. See, right. I great. got it. I got it because my brother started acting when he was about three mm-hmm. and, and he was working and my dad being an actor, and my mom, having been an actress, certainly, and she ended up getting back into the business right years yeah. later and having a great career as Gene Spiegel Howard, I learned by osmosis. Mm-hmm. I just, everything was second nature to me, and it would be the same thing as if, you know, a, a six or seven-year-old boy has a 14-year-old brother that includes them in playing baseball. Right, right. I, You know, it was like I was watching the big kids hit a curve and, uh, you know, no problem. Give me the bat. I can do that. <laughs> you know, and awesome. in fact, I had that. I had Ron was a great, great older brother. I mean, mm-hmm. it, not that not that I needed one because mom and dad were certainly ever present. And, and, and dad would just, you know, do anything for us and, and it, you know, and, and expect us to be good little Howards in return. Right. But, you know, it wasn't like I ever needed to come to Ron for consoling or anything, but he, right. he always included me, you know, mm. when like when he was, you know, 12 and I was seven, I was getting to play wiffle ball with him. I was getting to play over the line baseball, you know, all through my maturing as, as a, as a boy, um, I got to do things because Ron included me. I wasn't having to fend for myself. So he never yeah, did that right. thing where he like takes like underwear and throws it over your head and goes, ah, ha, ha, or like <laughs> soap in your ear. Like, not like when you were wild. Or, no. Oh, well, okay. Not why you're No, working. I did that to him. <laughs> <laughs> my older brother. Yeah, little, yeah, my brother I had this instinct. Yeah. I had this instinct that I knew I could get away with, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I know it irritated Ron when he was little, and I hope to God he's serious when he says it doesn't matter now, but I think somehow it does throw rubs on a little bit. You know, just, I got just, to do things. I got to do everything a lot sooner mm-hmm. than Ron got to do it. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I, and he was the first. Mom and dad were very protective. My mom, you know, and dad both came from the Lindbergh baby kidnapping era. I mean, that that, oh, that wow. was in their sure, mind. Sure. So us as little kids getting kidnapped was always something that was on mom's, the forefront of mom's mind. Wow. And as, as far as Ron getting to go to the park to shoot baskets or to do anything with any kind of autonomy, you know, ride a bicycle, that kind of thing. You know, they, they, they made Ron wait till a certain age. Well, then once Ron did it, and, you know, I would do it two or three years sooner than what Ron got to do. Yeah. And once, wow. Every once in a while, I remember him kind of complaining, but I had to wait till I was 10. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I just say, shut up. You know, I got it. It seems, though, like you had a situation that wasn't at all like, you know, you always heard the stories of the stage parents. It seems like you had a really healthy kind of yeah, yeah. a very grounded uh, experience. Yeah, we did. I mean, we did. I mean, listen, my dad and, you know, Rance Howard, absolutely a saint. And, you know, I, I my dad lived to be 89 years old and I worked with him right up until he fell ill. Literally, we worked on a movie about two weeks before he fell ill and then it took him a while to expire. He was in such good shape that, you know, he was incapacitated neurologically. Okay. Uh, but then his body just slowly kind of, you know, and then he went, and then he passed. But I worked with him as an actor right up until he passed and 88 years old when, when we worked together on this movie called Appleseed, 
it was just wonderful to see dad continuing to work and continuing to, you know, do what he did right up until he couldn't do it anymore. You know, he was, he was a legend in his own, in his own way. Yeah. In the feet in Hollywood. Absolutely. At the time he wasn't, the only thing he, he demanded of us or really insisted that we focus on was really doing the best we could and being prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, dad was always about preparation. Dad was, you know, he, he taught us that we were kids in an adult world and that we were going to have to, you know, really toe the line. Right. And it wasn't a matter of us. We, we just got it because he loved doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, right. my we, we watched my dad really not struggle, but, you know, the journey of being an actor, it's really trudging. You yeah. know? Sure. And dad trudged, but here's some brilliant stuff that he learned as a parent. One thing he said, no, he didn't learn it as a parent. He did it as a parent. And that was, he didn't use one nickel of the money that we earned as kids to fund the family. You know, um, if we wanted a, some kind of hobby thing or something, if we got to prove that we could do it, like one time when I was about 13 years old, I got the idea to get one of those remote control cars. Mm -hmm. And I was working on a TV series with Robert Carradine. Bobby Carradine and Carradine was older than I was. And he had the, he was a geek. I mean, and we put together this, I think it was one sixteenth scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was bigger one than what the model cars are now. Cause it was gasoline engine. No. <clears throat> and we, we must've spent two months putting this kit together and it, it was alive about 25 or 30 seconds. That <laughs> engine was way too hot. It, it got going and it just slammed into the curb. Bobby was driving it and it was like, well, that's about all that with that, you know, <laughs> uh, but no, as far as, as far as just day-to-day -day stuff like school books and, and supplies and living expenses or family vacation money, dad earned it. Right. And, right. and dad felt like that if the kid, if any child got whiff that they were the breadwinner, mm -hmm. that it would really mess up the family dynamic of, ah, yeah. uh, of the situation. And that, you know, listen, Dad's the dad, mom's the mom. We all have jobs and our jobs are not to make money. You know, uh -huh. our jobs are to do what we love to do. And, and yes, we had the money. And, and then, you know, the, part of it was the Coogan law helped put some of it away. Right. Um, right. Oh, right. And, right. And then some, and the rest of it was just mom and dad, you know, mm -hmm. and I immediately, when I turned 18 years old, I was in a position to buy a house and I paid cash for it. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. That's, wow. you know, nice. that's amazing. I, yeah, it was, awesome. and listen, they, listen, they, they took out 5% for manager fees. Mm -hmm. right. And my goodness, to have a manager for 5%. <laughs> <it's an idea. laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 So listen, both mom and dad, I'll never, I'll forever be grateful that, you That's know, awesome. I ended up, I ended up being their kid. Yeah. Well, you, you, know. you I mean, they obviously did a, an amazing job. But when you, you started out though, you did some acting, but then you did some voiceover stuff uh, in, in the early days. Uh, you did some stuff for Disney and you actually got a chance to meet Walt Disney. Could you tell us about that? Oh man, that was a wonderful experience because you know, mom, there are pictures of me at Disneyland in a crib, in a, in a, you know, <laughs> troll, a, stroller, a stroller. Right, right, right. you know, um, one of the monstro strollers they used to have back, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, my, my dad was relatively cheap when it came to stuff like that. Oh, I'm okay, sure it okay. was a good sturdy one, but you know, <laughs> I don't know how tip top it was. All right. But so I was, I was born a Disney kid. And mm -hmm. although oddly enough, you know, I, Ron and I both did a few Disney shows. We never were considered Disney kids. Sure. And, you know, in terms of, I, I never was on the Mickey Mouse Club or, you know, like I said, just didn't work that much for him. We lived right there. I mean, Disney was, I still live in the shadows of Disney. Mm -hmm. um, but, but getting to do, first I did Winnie the Pooh. And you yeah. see, you say, vo you say voiceover work. Yeah. And back then and even now, I don't know, there's no difference. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. when, you're do, when you do an on-camera thing, there's an extra part of you that really has to be there and you've got to be aware of certain technique and everything like <clears> that. But still, when I was learning, the fact is they just didn't photograph me, you know. Yeah. But right. I was, I did the dialogue for Rue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, back then you would do the, the looping, and I wouldn't call it looping, you would record the dialogue 
oh, a couple of years before the thing would come out. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Because you had to do the voice first, and then they animated to the voice. And we're talking about fellows in Burbank, California, hand drawing the cells. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was what Walt did. Pretty, and you know, the lot is still there, and there's still a big part of the lot that is pretty much unchanged. I mean, it's all very been corporatized, and the thing has grown, and they've they there's there's a building where the Zorro back lot used to be. Um, they now have office buildings and stuff. Oh, but Disney, wow. it was you know, it, it was a group magical place to be and so i did that and then it seemingly sometime right in the early days of gentle ben or maybe maybe before gentle ben i went in and did the uh baby elephant for the jungle book yeah and i i remember having a little bit of trouble because listen i am tone deaf and rhythm challenged <laughs> and that's sort of odd coming from a guy who had a punk rock band back in the 80s <laughs> a great band by the way oh thank you I'm, I'm listen myself and a few other fellows are really proud of the kipsters um and in fact i just had i had lunch this past weekend with the guitar player sabino he lives down in san diego he lives down in orange county and he came up and we hung out he actually gave me a guitar um, really? i'm seeing my 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 wife got me guitar lessons, and I haven't played in a long time. And I have kind of carpal tunnel uh, from my this this neck thing, and so she thought it would be a really good idea, both mentally and physically, for me to play the guitar. And so she get, she got me some guitar lessons. Sabino, I called Sabino to see if he knew, you know, where I might be able to get a good guitar. What what kind of guitar would be great? Because I just wanted an acoustic. And he had an Epiphone that he'd had around for years and years, and he drove up and gave it to me. And it was talking about the campuses. In fact, we listened to a little bit of the music after lunch. It's a great album. <laughs> that is a great <laughs> album. And, uh, it, and it's, really, it's really tight musically. Like it's uh, even, you know, we there, good. there are a lot we of punk really bands good. that kind of use that as a shortcut, but not that album. Yeah. And you know what? We, Scott, Scott Green and I are, he was my, we, we were friends since the second grade. He was my first roommate when I, got the house and you know he was he was with me all through the years that I owned this house and it was really the Burbank Youth Center you know <laughs> 19 20 21 year old kids and their buddy has a house and with a pool <laughs> we rehearsed the band rehearsed in the living room we we took recreational breaks front yard and backyard with wiffle ball and okay you know the the um I thought you were going somewhere else always, with the recreational breaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, the clubhouse was always a festive place to be, and there were certainly adult libations available at the, uh, <laughs> hey, you know, in the clubhouse. It could happen. Um, yeah, so, so no, the, the, those Kempsters, that was, you know, the, that was really a good time, and thank you for that shout-out. And uh, Oh, my God. Is there, more, is there more material that you're sitting on somewhere? Well, I have some more. I, listen, I have enough. I actually – put together another set of songs that included some covers and stuff that cool. that we did because we were big David Bowie people. Scott Green and I were, you know, he would, he, he would musically write the songs and him and I would come up with the lyrics and, and uh, we had a great time. I was just listening to Aladdin Sane, uh, the Bowie's album. And I remember distinctly the, the you know, our musical writing process included not stealing from, but taking a lot of the ideas, sure. and some of the structure from what Bowie was doing. We did a great cover of Queen Bitch, and we did a great cover of a song called What in the World, which was off the, was off the Low album. Yeah. You, you know. Cool. So, but wait, wait, hold on. Before somebody mentioned the Kempsters, I was about ready to sort of answer a question. Jungle Book. <laughs> Jungle Book. Oh, Jungle Book. Okay. You're the baby elephant. This, so, I love that little baby elephant. Well, and I had the damnedest time trying to get that marching song, trying to kind of do the dialogue two, in the marching three, song, because I had no time. I yeah. love that. Mm-hmm. It, well, the, the composer who was sitting at the grand piano, you know, in the scoring stage, trying to get me to hit the hit the beats, we were having, not having trouble, but it was not, it, I've never been musically just adept, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway, we were in there doing it. And I remember there was a man, and I don't know which of the film composers, there was two guys that did the music. One of them was at the piano. With the Sherman and, Brothers, right? Yeah. And they were doing that. We were, we were trying to do this song, and I saw in the engineer's room, and, you know, there's a big glass separating the engineer's room and the recording stage. 
I saw Walt Disney walk into the room and it was because you know, he was on TV and I knew who Walt was. I mean, the image was absolutely just, you know, it took your breath away. Right. And I saw he walked in and okay, you know, and then a couple of seconds later, I saw a set of eyes at the window of the scoring stage, you know, the actual, went the door, the, the door that pulled open, they had a little window. Right. And I saw the eyes peek in and we weren't recording anything. So Walt opened the door. He stepped into the recording stage. He got about, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 feet from me. Uh -huh. And very warmly, he raised his hand and said, you're doing a great job, Clint. <laughs> wow. <No>. Oh, nice. <laughs> Man. And, oh. and I'll never forget it. You know, and, That's awesome. And, and with that, he was gone. You know, it's not like he said, you know, he <laughs> didn't say, hey, you want to go have a pop or anything like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Still, I ride a tiny train around my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's running a studio, guys. He, he can't, like, hang but out that's, all the but time. But that's like, that's, like, magical just for that kind of, oh, you know, wow. that iconic figure to kind of, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, and, you know, like I said, we uh, grew up right around the corner from Roy Disney's house. And, you know, Disney has its fingerprints all over Burbank. Yeah. Um, all right. And, um, you know, Disney itself, there, there are people who might call Disney as a business cheap. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there are people that, that have mentioned, you know, welcome to the Disney family. Now bend over. <laughs> <laughs> they have a bit, listen, they always had a business model. Sure. That sure. included, that included, you know, not being ridiculous. You know, right. now, right. now listen, Granted, Walt was running a much different operation than sure. what they, what, what Iger, you know, and the pre yeah, Eisner. Yeah. I mean, the thing that completely morphed into something that, to me, you know, it is un not unbelievable because it happened. What Walt was able to create, and Walt knew there was a vacuum of, of family entertainment, and if he could draw that young family into his world, that, you know, the magical... The, the magical presence of what he offered hope and, and genuine entertainment, you know, the animation was always really superior. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. it would, you know, it's like, God, you know, there's a guy that invented it. What my cat and I talk about, you know, magical movies and stuff, you know, and, but it always comes back to, I say to her, you know, that was not Jim Carrey that invented that. There was a guy sitting somewhere at a typewriter years before, Mm -hmm. that wrote the book, mm -hmm. The Truman Show, or, you know, wrote Dumb and Dumber. I mean, Jim Carrey brought it to life in a way that was magical. Mm -hmm. But he didn't invent it. It all started with a guy with a cigar and probably a, a, a glass of scotch thinking of, an idea, <laughs> thinking of an idea that he could sell in the business world. Ultimately, Roy and his brother, Walt, did that. You know, yeah. and they, they assembled a, a, a wonderful set, a wonderful team of people around and they made the magic happen. So, and, you know, I give them credit. walk into Disneyland, I remember walking into that place as a kid and then walking into it years later. And every single time that you walk through those gates, you are transported. It's like no other place. It's like no other amusement park. And right. you'll go to a Six Flags and you'll get kind of like, a, is a fight about to start? <laughs> no. Yeah. no, you walk into Disneyland, you feel safe, you feel welcomed, everybody's friendly and helpful, and, uh, and I've been to the ones in Japan, and it's the same thing, and to be able to, to have that continuity is incredible. Yeah, well, you know, and they did it in a way that wasn't like the McDonald's Big Mac either. You know, talking about Disney, they were able to, when you enter the Magic Kingdom, there is a feeling, and it's not just romance or it's not just nostalgia. It's comfortable. And yes. you struck, you know, yeah. and on the busiest day down at the Anaheim at Disneyland in Anaheim, even if it's just an absolute zoo, which I've tried to avoid, but once in a while I've been in a position it happens. Of the year where you, yeah. you end up in August and you're literally elbow to elbow with people. Um, but you walk down Main Street and it's just, it's a, it's a different place. Yeah. You know, and then you move off to the various worlds and the various lands, Tomorrowland and the new Star Wars thing. We went and checked it out and it's pretty amazing. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. then talk, talk about a vibe that's positive. And, yes. you know, you can sort of blame that. I mean, Disney gets a lot of the credit, but George really, you know, built that. 
Sure. You know? sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's that's all a whole other magical thing. What George did, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And I was around. You know, I auditioned. I auditioned for Star Wars. Really? Oh, wait, really? wait, wait, wait. Original Star Wars. You know, a in, ni- in 1977 or 76, whatever. No. It was. Wow. Yeah. Really? What, what role? Yeah. No, I think what? it actually was about 75. What role? Okay. I auditioned for Luke. Really? Wow. Yeah. I totally was, see that. And <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a thing where where they you know back in those days there was no videotape, right? Uh, and if you had any kind of credibility, if you had any kind of a name or whatever, they were having huge casting sessions, you know. Right. And I remember seeing Mark Hamill because I had. I had been in the mix on a couple of movies. You know, I was becoming a man. I was, too, I was still a teenager, but I was sure. starting to compete in the adult world. And he was a, a baby face kid that, yeah. you know. <clears throat> and so anyway, he was at the audition. I'm sure thinking back, there were people like Darby Hinton and Mark McClure. I know Mark may not have been in the business, but anybody kind of blonde and, you know. And anyway, they, you know, George knew me through Ron because they had done American Graffiti. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I walked into the room and I was nervous and Francis Coppola was in the casting session. Fred oh Roos, Fred Roos was in the casting session. I think Gino Havens was in the casting session. He was sort of a helper of, for George and they had all worked on, on uh, American graffiti. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and man, you know, when you see Francis Coppola for the first time in your life, it takes your breath away. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, cause he was larger than life in a real way. And George, I was, of course, anxious to meet George, you know, because Ron had worked for him and I had never met him. And he, he was spun around in the, in the director's chair and, and you couldn't see him. It was not a director's chair. It was a leather chair. And he turned around and he looked at me and he went, Commander Baylock, Corbinite Maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> now, you got to understand, I was, a, I was a young man trying to get an adult role. <laughs> and the first thing out of the director's mouth is a right. recall of something I did when I was six or seven years old. <laughs> in in my mind, I was saying, George, get a friggin' life here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up because, I mean, you, you are still, yes, you are. Well, we, love we, we love that. We love that. Well, at, look, well, like, look, this is that, classic Star Trek. Yeah, and at that age, Clint, like you said, if you're six or seven, by that point, I mean, how much did you kind of understand what was going on as far as the plot of the movie or anything or, or the show? Did you, you audition? Know? No, nothing. Did you, oh, no. Did you audition that, for that? You know, I don't remember. I, I'm sure I had to because I was actually thinking back the other day. You know, I had done an episode of The Bonanza that included, or not The Bonanza, Bonanza, mm-hmm. that had included a lot of dialogue. And, you know, mm-hmm. and, and again, there's, people can see that. And casting directors and producers can look at that and go, well, that kid's pretty good. But this Star Trek thing was so different. Right, right. I am sure. Yes, I know. I, in fact, I may be making this up. You know how memory is. <laughs> well, your you memory's know, pretty amazing I, so far. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Really? I can remember telling the story, you know. So back, there was a time at which I did remember and I was telling the story. But I, the first thing they told me was, and not that I asked, but that they were going to put my voice through a synthesizer. <gasps> right. And that that's what they were going to do. They were going to twist my voice up to where I really was not a six or seven year old boy. Right. I was a 600 year old alien. Yeah. <laughs> right. That was commanding this ship all by himself. I knew I was playing an adult. Mm-hmm. You know, now, and, and they didn't, I don't believe they ever said, well, we're going to use a synthesizer or we're going to just get somebody to replace the dialogue. Right. Of course, you know, I mean, I was going to have to learn the dialogue anyway, because it was a scene back sure. and forth. Mm-hmm. So whether, whether it was coming out of my mouth or whether they were twisting it through a synthesizer, which I didn't really understand at the time, I just thought synthesizer was a pretty cool word. <laughs> um, right. As it turns out, they chose to, to have, professional actors give the nuance of the you know, inflection and the two guys that did both the puppet yeah. and me were just absolutely superior. The mm-hmm. guy, I mean, I've seen it now many, many times and the guy that looped me when they came down by, by, um, what do you call it? When they beam me down. Sure. When they, when they transport over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When they transported down to my ship and we actually had the scene, mm-hmm. um, 
you know, the guy that did that, the inflection, I mean, it was just brilliant. And, you know, it was only the first season of a show that was barely going to stay on the air. Right, yeah. right. And, yeah. and my dad and I have talked about it a lot. I mean, Joe Sargent was a great director. Yes. My dad had the utmost respect for Joe Sargent. And, and, and you know, Joe, Joe Sargent was giving the actors bits that they would end up using oh, for wow. the rest of the show. And listen, it was Gene Roddenberry was a showrunner. Right, Gene right. Roddenberry oh. had worked on a Western the year before. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, now, now he may have had Star Trek in his pocket and he and knew that he wanted to do it and everything, but by God, he was doing, you know, Maverick Boy last sure. season. Right. And these, like guys were all, him. these guys were all just doing a job trying to stay on the air. Right. You know, and I didn't, I didn't really understand that at the time when, when we shot, I was aware that it was a science fiction show. I made sure that dad took his Polaroid camera down there to the set. We got some great photos. Wow. Did you? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well there was, you know, and you know how the Polaroid was, it wasn't really that good of an image. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes. 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 Early days. Dad, yes. dad took a shot of the puppet mm-hmm. that the people at Star Trek later on, I think when CBS started putting it out on DVD, they actually used that photo that dad oh, wow. had. Wow. It was a really good image of the puppet. Nice. And then pictures of me on the bridge, you know. Um, and you see, the one thing, there was, no, there was no insecurity or I was not nervous at all because even at that age, dad would have me so prepared. And I was so confident that I had the dialogue, I had the sort of the ability to conquer any sort of distractions. And that was always a big one. It was always big because, you know, dad knew that the job came with a lot of distractions. And in our preparation, dad would introduce those distractions to me to get me used to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and again, having watched Ron do it, and I don't recall ever having conversations with him about acting, but I just, by osmosis, I was learning how to do it. And, you know, that scene probably only took two hours to do. Three right, hours really, yeah. to do tops. I mean, it's a television show. They're they're banging out a whole yeah, other scene. Yeah, on one churning, side churning it out. Yeah. And you know, I had to go to school. And first, they put they they. I went to school. They put the skull cap on me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they brought me to the set because they knew they only had one more setup to do on another part of the soundstage. And I will never forget that when I was at my I was at my set and I saw that everything was kind of cool. Everything was small and. I kind of knew where I was going to sit, but nothing had been worked out yet. And I heard the two bells go off, Mm -hmm. you know, on a soundstage, one bell means Mm -hmm. we're rolling. Two bells means we've cut. Mm -hmm. And I heard the two bells and I started to see the crew and some of the cast members come out from the shadows and come out from between the sets and stuff and come towards my, my, my set. And it, it, it was a really good feeling and I really enjoyed it. It didn't make, get me, you know, big in the bridges or anything. It was just, it was like, wow, look at this. This is really, this is cool. <laughs> never any insecurity. My insecurities as an actor really didn't start till, you know, past puberty, you sure. know, in, in, in adolescence. Right. And then of course I'm just like anybody else. I'm a neurotic actor. Sure. You know, if I don't hear the, <laughs> if I don't hear the director tell me that it's spot on within a couple of minutes, I'm starting to get <laughs> <Right>. spot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and just wait, just for listeners who who are just tuning in, we're we're talking just about the Corbomite the uh, the Corbomite uh, maneuver from 1966, which is also a really well written episode. And you have a really nice arc for the for Bailey, Mr. Bailey. Like it's it's a really w- beautifully written episode too. One of the best, one of the most remembered iconic yeah. episodes of Star Trek. It really is good. Yeah, and you know, Clinton, how you were saying, like you know, you were that that age as you got a little older. Like to me, one of your most impressive, more like nuanced performances, still as a kid actor, but a little older, was in 1971 when you did the Night Gallery episode, uh, The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes. That's a chilling, a chilling episode, you know, and, but you, you carry that really well. Like the, the whole premise of that episode, I don't really want to give too much away for those who haven't seen it, but it's this kid who, you know, this precocious young kid who's like maybe nine or 10 and he can predict earthquakes and he can predict the future and he becomes this kind of TV celebrity, but then something happens where he doesn't really want to say what's going to happen on a certain day. But when you find out what's going on, it's really chilling. But the way you kind of are carrying that inside a little kid, knowing that it's, it's sad and, and chilling. 
Yeah, the, that, the, the depth and the like the gravitas in the performance is actually really yeah. commanding. It's just really like, impressive. What memories do you have working on that episode on that show? Oh, uh, you know, I had I was probably twelve by then, and I had v- v- very vivid memories. I knew the gravity of the material. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm not not buying into it as you know, as a futurist or anything, but I understood the science fiction nature of it. Right. Um, and that this boy could see things and he could predict the future. And, you know, in the episode, the very first thing is out of the blue. I predict that this child that was been lost in the Sierras is going to get found. Right. And then I predict an earthquake in San Francisco that happens. And then I become a big celebrity, you know, and that Michael Constantine was in the episode. And he right, was, I remember. Right. And there was a fellow that played my grandfather. Oh, yeah. Great character actor. Yeah. Joseph Cotton Old. I mean, Joseph Cotton <laughs> and Citizen Kane, old. this guy was old, <laughs> but he was a good actor. I had a great experience. John Badham directed the episode. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. And this so is you- right in the era when, like, Spielberg was beginning to do stuff for Universal, and yep. Badham was doing stuff for Universal. And, and uh, you know, also, we, we filmed it. There was a local independent station, and it still is here in L.A., called KCOP Channel 13. Yeah, sure. And ch- Channel 13 used to do wrestling. <laughs> they would they, like every Wednesday night they would have a wrestling show and they would just do it at the studio and they would put up some bleachers and they probably would load in a hundred fans and they would do these, this wrestling show. And one of the days that we were filming, I think we shot at the studio two days. And one of the days we were filming, they were getting ready to tape the wrestling that night. And I, being a sports guy, dad was really into boxing and wrestling was always Freddie Blassie and John Tolis, the pencil neck geek. And, and the <laughs> sheep. Haystack and, and Calhoun. And so, yes, yes. No, Haystack Calhoun. That's an awesome, that's a good one. Touche for you. That's a great one. <laughs> um, we saw them rehearsing. You know, oh, wow. and I was old enough to understand that it wasn't real and that they were working it out and they right. were making sure that it was choreographed. And dad explained to me that they were, this was like a stunt fight and they were, you know, organized. Right. We didn't see too much of it, but enough of it for me to be really interested. And as a well, as well as a break away from this night gallery episode and the boatload of dialogue that, that oh that yeah, yeah, absolutely. you know, the volume just the pure volume of dialogue and dad being, you know, really insisting on being prepared. There was no faking it. There was going to be no teleprompter. There was going to be right. nothing. I, I was going to learn that stuff and I was going to be able to do it. And, you know, and, and dad's thing was, you know, all about motive and, and, you know, first of all, the real simplistic way of teaching a child to act is to make sure the child knows where he just was and what he wants to do in the moment that the scene is happening and then where he thinks he's going to go, mm-hmm. you know, into the future. And, and, and listen, like, have you just been playing with toys and are you now hungry and would you like some ice cream? Mm-hmm. And setting those things in place were very simple things that dad taught. The night gallery was a chance. I knew what I was doing when I was letting the public off. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew whether I was clairvoyant and I understood that if I said this, the, the, the public was going to think that. Right. Or right. It just in the moment of me having the flash of going, my God, this, there's, our, the sun is going to explode. There's going right. to be a Nova. That I quickly concocted this, this idea of saying, you know, things are going to be better. Mm-hmm. Because right, they, right. they can't get any worse. Which, yeah, you know. No more war, yeah, no more you, suffering. Yeah. You yeah. definitely weren't lying in that. Yeah, school. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never had the gloom and doom idea. I never had the gloom and doom idea about our, you know, the, the world being in such peril and stuff like that. I just didn't, never thought that way. Although, you know, remember, I was, I was going to public school when we would do the, you know, the drop and duck under the, under oh, yeah. the uh, yeah, cover, yeah. yeah. The, the the siren would go off, and we would be mimicking what would happen if there was a nuclear explosion, wow. which is pretty, <laughs> which is That's... pretty lame. But yet, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I worried about that some as as a kid. Like I had a few big question issues, not issues, but big questions that I would talk with with my dad about. One was the thoughts that run through my head, you know, and some mm. of them are all that pure. <laughs> and early on, 
early on, dad let me off the hook. And he's, you know, he, he said, he told me the story that he had a vision when he was young of shooting his mother, mm-hmm. you wow. know, just, well, yeah. And, and like when my dad was 10 years old, he had a 22 rifle, mm, you wow. know, and he, and it worried him and his grandfathers or his dad sort of talked to him and let him off the hook. And, and so anyway, but about, about the whole nuclear thing, you know, especially going through the, I wasn't really aware of Bay of Pigs or anything like that, but the, the Cold War of the early 60s and into the 60s, you mm-hmm. know, dad just reminded me one time, he goes, you know, uh, I went through World War II when I was a kid and the, people were talking about the world coming to an end then. So I think we can right, all right. rest yeah. assured that it, it's been a long time and everything seems to be fine. Now, you know, mm-hmm. who knows? I know, listen, it's above my pay grade. it's a little emotionally kind of funky from time to time to you know realize that boy I got hired to play that character you know or that I happen to be born on Adolf Hitler's birthday you know and into the horror genre (laughs) into the horror genre I was in evil speak and you know I got possessed by the devil and cut off a bunch of people's heads I love that movie Stanley Cooper Smith it's a great role by the way Stanley or or Stanley Cooper dick it depends on exactly (laughs) exactly Sean and I the minute it came out on (laughs) blu-ray yes yes Uh, it really is and but especially because I think when they originally released it theatrically they cut a lot of the effects and the gore out. Evil so fi- finally you see evil speak in all its uncut glory. The way it should be. So wait, in violent hogs. But wait, when it came out <laughs> in 81, so there's, there was stuff that was not put into the movie. Yeah. The, well, there, it was trimmed for an R, but I think it was trimmed a lot more like the, the Blu-ray release has all the, un- I think it's an uncut version. Yeah. But that <laughs> movie has a nice build. It builds up so well. But you you know, Stanley is put upon so much but the payoff in the last 20 minutes oh, is so oh. awesome. It is complete chaos, and it's it's so fun. We know it's it, you know, we know movie. it's coming, but we're yeah, just like, yeah. oh, oh, I can't wait. So, it's Clint, you were, you were the star of this. You were the, the you were the star of this film. Yeah. Yes. So, was that fun to work on? I mean, that must have been, was it a tight schedule? Oh, was it? Yeah. First of all, low-budget little horror movie, independently yeah. made. Um, yeah. I think it probably took us about six weeks to do. Wow. You know, we spent we spent about three weeks up in Santa Barbara shooting. It was a, um, a monastery up in Santa mm-hmm. Barbara, and we used it as the exterior of the uh, of the what was the name of the school? The, the military and, school, yeah. Andover Academy, or something. something yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but that was a great experience for me. It was not my first adult role, but it was the first time there where I was brought in in a creative way, Eric Weston was a young director at the time and he was getting the opportunity to direct this thing. And a fellow named Irv Goodenough who passed away a few years back, uh, he was a producer, he was a, a cinematographer and actually Irv and I crossed paths one, two, three, at least three times professionally, actually a couple of times on small little independent things down in Florida. Irv was really a special guy and so was Eric. And they brought me into this creative trio of people, you know, it was me and Eric and, and Irv and we solved a lot of the problems. And in fact, one, one of the killings, the killing of the Latin teacher was, was something we were figuring out what was scheduled was really not working and not right. And I invented the whole idea of Stanley grabbing him by his clothes and throwing him supernaturally <laughs> up and having him impaled with the, you know, chandelier yeah, on the ceiling yeah 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 so anyway they did that and it was listen it's it's a it's it's a b-horror movie and it but has the, the, again and the effects in that film are really good though all the gore effects are really and you had rg armstrong great character actor in there there's my yeah. friend crowbar <laughs> <laughs> by the way why is why is there a crazed man like that living in the basement of, the, of the, <laughs> like, what's going on but what that's i so want to know is do they still have that miss artillery pageant <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. My goodness. That was a good day. That was a good night of shooting. That yeah. really was. That yeah. was fun. That it was, was fun. really, it's really quite a, like I said, the ending is so elaborate and the, the chaos and destruction is really impressive in that movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, so okay, fun. a little a little tidbit about Evil Speak that, you know, I I've mentioned it before, but it's, you know, we they they got the the inside of a church down in East Los Angeles. 
Mm-hmm. And they were getting ready to build a freeway that connect the 105 freeway. Mm-hmm. And they had they had acquired all the land and this so there was a church that was going to get demolished. And the producers found out about it and they went down there and the schedule would permit and they went and they sort of fixed up the inside of this thing with the intent of to, at the end destroying it. And, it, and <laughs> the, people, the people that were leveling the neighborhood said that, well, that's fine, you know, just don't start a fire. Um, <laughs> and so there was a moment we shot, first of all, that was one day I shot over 24 hours consecutively. No. Wow. Wow. Because, we had to get out of the location. No, you know, I, was up yeah. On, yeah. I was up on wires and uh, it was a long haul, but, and I made a lot of money that day because I was only making scale on the movie. They only paid me scale. I had to buy my own toupee for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but when I was not privy to this scene, but Eric said it really did happen. And it was really sad as the, the, the old minister of the church had heard the church was they were shooting a movie there Uh-oh. and he was an old guy and and he walked inside the church and saw how it had been fixed up mm-hmm. and he like dropped to his knees and he goes praise the lord my church oh has my been gosh. saved <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> nobody had the heart to tell the guy that just you know that next night it was going to get burned to the ground oh my gosh <laughs> you know, none of that none of <laughs> yeah. that was see, well, see or, or a special effects team that was using yeah. a lot of rubber cement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. On that movie, I was on, we shot the inside at a um, at, at just a, a warehouse in in Silmar, I believe. We shot for a few weeks in this where all the stuff in the catacombs and all the stuff down there where I was doing the incantations and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, none of that was CG. And right. Oh yeah. All, right. And you know the the best way to make movie fire is rubber cement. Mm -hmm. And so basically they're just slathering this rubber cement all over everywhere and lighting it. Now rubber cement doesn't burn very clean. And for the few weeks that we were there, I was, I was, I was picking some prodigious boogers. I was picking boogers that were this color. out of (laughs) Wow. Yeah, uh, but a great, you know, listen, an experience that I'll never forget. And that's I it's remember, great. Well, we love it. I remember love talking to my dad about it. I remember talking to my dad about the, um, about doing it because, you know, reading the script and, and, and uh, you know, kind of, I don't know, the iffy material here This talking about, <laughs> you know, demonic possession and right. my character gets possessed and I live by the end. I don't, I don't die. Right. Um, Where does evil uh, speak to? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. We had talked about it from time to time. I don't know. Maybe that ship's already sailed. Nope. <laughs> nope. We're getting the funding. Wait, wait. I would love to do it. I, there's a great story about evil living inside the internet. I mean, it's yeah. so yeah. Sure. Now, now, yes. now, now it was a think, good right. Think, think about it, the computers that were in that film. I <laughs> yeah. mean, come on, compared to today, <laughs> right? Right. Well, they were Total still sense. using DOS programming. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> I love the yeah. graphics with like the well, pentagram. That's what, about, that's what I love about the movie too. Is <laughs> only through Satan could you get those kind of graphics back then? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's really well, fun. he had the insight to the good animators. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, no, great. Uh, listen, you know one thing about that movie. Uh, first of all, everybody talks about the seeing the complete uncut version, mm-hmm. and that's not true. Oh, Eric really? Weston, Eric Weston had cut about a two and a half hour version of the movie wow. that had a lot more stuff. Wow. And it was much more graphic. Really. Um, Eric had a falling out with the production company, with the producers, mm, oh. which I'm, it's a long time ago and my memory is a little fuzzy, but it may or may not have led to some fisticuffs. Oh, wow. You know, oh. Which happens on, you know, which happens. Good guys get angry and if I, you know, yeah. next thing you know, yeah. the, the associate producer and the director are friggin' duking it out like a hockey game. Um, and then Silvio Tabot the executive producer, we actually did a day of reshoots and uh, uh-huh. there was a scene where I was being loaded into a, like a, a, a rubber, what do you call it? A, not a paddy wagon, but it was a, it was a vehicle for, for an insane asylum. Uh-huh. 
Uh-huh. So they, they actually showed me in the flesh at the end, being in a straight jacket, being mm-hmm. put into this, you know, um, vehicle to be taken to Sunnydale uh, Saint Asylum or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but Eric's version, although I knew it was too long mm-hmm. and it probably was pretty clunky, I thought was a lot better than what finally what they finally came out with. And Eric and I have known each other over the years, you know, and like, for instance, the beef, one of the beefs they had is there was a scene where the Sarge, where Sarge pulls out Bubba's heart. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was a fully realized gag. I mean, the heart was in RG's hand and it was beating, you know, Mm -hmm. and immediately the, the, the rating company, the MPAA or whatever the outfit was called at the time, they labeled it an X. Uh, and then they made the product, they made the company go back and cut literally frame by frame, you know, enough, how much of the heart can you show? And can you even show it being pulled out of his chest and various things like that? How much of the pigs eating the woman can you really show? Mm-hmm. And they really, because it was an independent movie, they seemed to be pretty hard on evil speak. And later on that year, Indiana Jones came out. Indiana Jones and the right. Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom. Right. And, India, yes. and they had they had the same gag of a heart being pulled out. But that was PG thirteen though. I know. Correctly. Yeah. And I mean, Eric Eric always had a real bad, you know, bone to pick on that because for crying out loud, you know, Steven Spielberg can do it and it becomes a popcorn movie. Right. And we do an evil speak and and they threaten us with an X. Oh mm. my God. Did anyone ever yeah. tell them like, you know, we didn't really rip a heart from someone? <laughs> well yeah you know I, there's always that little disclaimer at the end of every movie saying you know any anything any hearts that's similar, that were ripped out are purely coincidental <laughs> yeah, no heart was hurt no heart was no hurt, heart was hurt. This movie. <laughs> oh, no man. dog was hurt no dog we did have one of the Freds died oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and you know the producers thought they were real smart they, they got a litter of pups you know that were the same Mm-hmm. And the one, the money pup that they had immediately on being on the set or whatever, just got sick and died. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, the, the backup, you know, they, they, if you look close, it's definitely a different dog here and there. Right. Um, but listen, that was one, that was one scene mm-hmm. that I didn't have to worry about crying. Uh-huh. And I used as an adult, remember I did this when I was about 21 years old Yeah. and as an adult, I would go back if I needed to whip up emotion. Mm-hmm. There were two things that I've always that I've always used, and I would take myself back to that space of being Stanley there holding the butchered dog. Oh, and I could still make myself cry right now if I really wanted to, thinking about poor little Fred. You know how he got screwed over by these these a holes, and and you know I could get myself into that spot pretty quick. Yeah. And then there was I did a movie when I was thirteen years old called The Red Pony, mm-hmm. and it involved me losing the colt, the pony. Was, yeah. you know, Hank Fonda had given me the colt as a gift and the colt had gotten the strangles and died. Mm-hmm. And there was a scene where I was with my classmates and everybody was saying, well, summer's going to start. What are you going to do for the summer? And s- some kid mentioned one thing and some kid mentioned another. And I mentioned that I was going to ride gavel in mountain. And everybody knew that the horse was dead. And uh-huh. I continued on telling the story about I'm going to ride him you know, clean to the ocean and then ride him up and down the beach Never mm-hmm. rode a horse along the beach. Mm-hmm. And, and as an adult, either, either Stanley Cooper Smith in his plight or my, my moments in the red pony are moments that I used if I needed to drum up, you right. know, if it wasn't organic and I needed mm-hmm. to drum up emotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we have to discuss probably, I would say this is probably one of my favorite films of all time. I knew you're, I, I know this. I knew and it. That is the great rock and roll high school. Yes. 79. Eagle Bauer Enterprises is what I've mapped my entire entrepreneurial approach through. <laughs> and, and, I, and I imagine you're driving a 67 Volkswagen hatchback about now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have an office and a bathroom. <laughs> and, and, and you're a huge Ramones fan, too. Eagle Bauer. I mean, there's so much in this movie that it's, it's actually a movie that every time I go back to it, I think it's funnier each time. And it really is. It's Eagle classic. Bauer is so great. What I love about Eagle Bauer, too, is that 
the gag could be so simple as like, oh, he's just like this, you know, rinky dink con man who's got this, you know, office in the bathroom, but it's a great office. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's like the TARDIS from Doctor Who. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Like, I just, I love but it. But also, like, kind of opposite of, of Cooper Smith, you get to play now the guy who's like, he, he's got all the answer. He's, he's the cool yeah. guy that everybody comes to, which is great. Well, you know what? And also, I remember on, on, on that movie, you know, I knew I was playing the oily, sleazy, you know, salesman, <laughs> shyster guy. And, and yet, it was like, you know, but he's got all the sincerity. He's got all the belief. It works for him. Right. What his act, Ego Bauer's act worked for Ego Bauer. Yeah, you know? it's positive thinking. And never once, you know, listen, I don't know what is this. I was lucky when I kind of thought of this, but you just don't blink when you're doing a character like Ego Bauer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, and of course, you can't blink on a Roger Corman movie because the thing's done in about you know, 18 <laughs> hours. Right. You know, a little known fact about Rock and Roll High School, my brother actually acted in the movie and got cut out. Really? Like, no. Yeah. Did, did you he ever played, say, did you, at Christmas time, you go, well, you were cut out of uh, Rock and Roll High School. <laughs> right. Where is yes, he now? Yes, I, yes, I've said that to him. <laughs> 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 it was it was a day. It was when all hell was breaking loose at Vince Lombardi High School, and you know the food fight with the mm-hmm. with the uh, Apple Brown Betty. Yes, Apple Brown <laughs> Betty. All right, so all the chaos. Ron was because Alan Arkish, who had directed, um, who had been Ron's second unit director on Grand Theft Auto, right? Literally within the next year, he was doing Rock and Roll High School. Wow. So, so you know, as a favor, as in, in solidarity for all the filmmakers who are working for Roger. I mean, Ron came and, and did it, and it was a bit where he was this freshman. It was like he was a compadre of the freshman that was in the movie. The oh, freshman okay. that was in the movie was one of the writers. Oh, wow. I, think, <laughs> I believe it was Russ Devonch. If I, there was Richard Whitley and Russ Devonch. And um, mm. he, played the, he played the one freshman, but Ron played a little nerd. And the scene was me and him literally meeting center frame, you know, and having a little ta 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 as chaos was going on around the Oh, school. that's cool. That's great. And, and it, I, it just didn't work, and, and they cut it. You know? Right. Really? It seemed to be, though. Yeah, I see. I'll take it. Roger probably used it as short ends or something somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know whether they kept all the negative from all the. Uh, can you imagine how many feet of film Roger shot over the years? Oh my god! Think about yeah. all the movies. I mean, because listen, back then, and I know you know people kept vaults. Things were in vaults always. They they wouldn't throw things away. Finally, I'm sure Roger pitched you know dailies. They I know they printed it. They were satisfied with it. It's just in the final version of the movie, the keep to keep the pace of the whole sequence going. Right. They just didn't have time for that. You know, right, right. Um, I don't think Ron, Ron didn't lose any. Ron didn't lose any sleep over the fact he wasn't in Rock and Roll High School. <laughs> <laughs> I like, you know, I like though about Eagle Bauer though is you were saying that he's like he's kind of like the oily con man, but he he actually I I get the feeling when I watch that movie that. Maybe initially to get you to sign the paper, maybe he's he's that guy. But once he's got the job, he believes in it a hundred percent. Like he's right. gonna pull this off. Oh, Tom Roberts was getting laid. He was gonna get laid. Right, right, <clears throat> right. And by Riff Randall. Yes, mm-hmm. that's and right. Come hook a crook, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Kate, maybe Kate I didn't Rambo say that quite easier. right. Yeah, and yeah. Identified and celebrated by hook or crook. Um, <laughs> Listen, it was fun working on that movie. Vince Van Patten and I struck up a great relationship, and 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 you know he was really a good guy. And, so, and were there any? Uh, did you have any kind of like any Ramones. real interaction with the Ramones? I mean, did, yeah, had you was... heard of them? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah at that time. Okay, I had heard of them. I, I had fallen in love with music, and they were not who I had fallen in love with. I see. <laughs> um, but the first music I listened to was David Bowie and Alice Cooper. Yeah. And, you know, I found this band in 1976 or 77 called Cheap Trick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. And Cheap, and cheap Trick, well, yeah. It, well, you got great taste. Because Cheap you. Trick is so, Cheap Trick is so dialed, it is unbelievable. One of the greatest uh, bands of all time. 
Yes, I think so. Yeah. Great, well, I can't say it because, you know, before they open every concert, it's the greatest friggin' band <laughs> around. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got to meet them and know them. But wait, here's the rub, you know. They were, and I knew this because it was, there was no audition for Rock and Roll High School. Alan called me and said, I've got this character, read the script, what do you think? And I said, yes, right away, before cool. they had hired any musical act. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. Cheap Trick was one of the bands they were considering. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Wow, yeah. And, and Cheap Trick, Cheap Trick, like, wanted $100,000 for their participation in the movie, <laughs> to do the soundtrack to, you know, do all that. And the Ramones were willing to do it all in for 40. <laughs> right. right. Oh, wow. and at that point, you know, that casting decision got made. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty quick. quick. <laughs> I've talked, I, I talked let's to go. Robin. <laughs> I talked to Robin and Rick about that years later because I've become, I, you know, know them, uh, the friends, you know, we don't exchange, you know, swap spit or anything like that. But, <laughs> okay. but when they're around, I see them and I, I've talked to Rick occasionally and certainly went around and congratulated them when they got into the rock and roll hall of fame and all that stuff. Sure. I, I became friends actually, the fellow that I'm closest to is Rick Nielsen's son, Dax. And, you know, Dax really? took over for, for Bunny Carlos playing That's the drums. Right, yeah. And I, you know, listen, it's really cool to, the vision of seeing Rick Nielsen playing guitar and Dax Nielsen playing the drums. And I saw this one time on Dax's Facebook page. He had a picture of that where Rick was like twisted around looking at the drummer and Dax was really busy on the drum kit. And the way Dax, the, the way he captioned the photo was fathers take their sons to work day. <laughs> nice. And I know that I've lived an exotic life, but boy, oh boy, to be the son and the drummer of an act like Cheap Trick. Oh, yeah. You know? right. And and anyway, it's uh, uh but Cheap Trick for the first 10 years from 1979, 78, 79 on into the 80s, I was sort of kind of generally disappointed that they hadn't gone ahead and hired Cheap Trick because then Cheap Trick broke with a little a little album called In Color, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and listen, the rest is history. They were really, they are fabulous. And Rob, Robin Zander was a great singer and, and mm -hmm. really wrote great tunes. And talk about angry young man music. That, in fact, the Cheap Trick was very much an inspiration, not an inspiration, but we borrowed a lot of like, Cheap Trick's energy when we were doing the Kempsters, you okay. know, and realizing that, you know, we were a three-piece man. We were two, well, two good four piece, two guitars, a bass, and a drummer. Keep it really simple. Um, if you can't tell the song in two minutes and twenty seconds, you're doing something wrong. I know that's something the Ramones, the Ramones were famous for. They can, they yeah. can whip off a friggin' real toe tapper in a minute and ten. You know, yeah. right. whenever, whenever I would make a mixtape, and you know, you always you had all your songs, and at the very end, you had a little bit of space left. I'd throw in a Ramones song. <laughs> I go. got something that's forty eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, back to the back to Rock and Roll High School. It was a great experience because, you know, the concert footage we yeah. shot at the, at the Roxy in Hollywood. Wow. The backstage stuff was shot at the Whiskey. Wow. And wow. the Ramones, Ramones were there both nights and getting to sort of be around them. They were in concert mode then. Um, right. Marky, the drummer, was the most approachable. I never really had an opportunity to talk to Joey. But Johnny, I became friends with, and I ran into Johnny years later with Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie and Johnny Ramone would go around to autograph shows to collect posters and stuff. There was always, there was a right. famous Hollywood collectors show in Hollywood. We go all the oh, yeah. We, yeah, yeah, probably I love going. Yeah, yeah. I love well, it. Well, I saw, and listen, he wasn't trying to be incognito. I know if, if John really wanted to be incognito, he wouldn't wear the long hair and the and, and, and <laughs> leather jacket, right, but right. him and Rob showed up and they were just looking at posters and stuff. And, and uh, Rob was friends with Johnny and I got to know him. And he, in fact, did an episode of the Clint Howard variety show. Nice. Wow. He was kind enough to come down and be a celebrity on the Clint Howard variety show. And it wasn't too much longer before he, he passed away. Oh, I mean, it was wow, maybe yeah. in a couple of, a couple of years. Um, Johnny was and, so important because he, he really was the glue that held that band together. Like, he was the business side of it. He was the guy who, you know, maintained, hey, you know, everybody have the same leather jackets and his guitar style. Not many guitars could even come close to emulating him or play that fast. 
No, you know, he was pretty good. I mean, he, he was a really good player. Although I'll tell you what, I remember when they were recording the song Rock and Roll High School for the album. Mm -hmm. And when PJ Souls had to sing it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because it's supposed it, to be like her song that she gives to them. Right, right, right yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there was, I think this, there was a, a routine in the gym where they're all dancing to yeah. it. And PJ's actually singing and she's on the soundtrack. Well, the Ramones couldn't do it because huh. it, it was in a different key. Mm -hmm. um, oh. mm. And and they tried, the Ramones sort of tried to do it. And listen, I was not there. I don't know, you know, but I they ended up bringing in musicians to play it. I mean, it, it's certainly copyable music. Right. Um, but their spirit, listen, I lived, the Kempsters were in the punk world. We opened for the Dickies. We, oh, nice. We, oh. Yeah, I love yeah, the Dickies. That, you drive me uh, ape, you big gorilla. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in a pagoda with Trisha Toyota. With Trisha Toyota, <laughs> Annie uh, Moe and Jack—they're all classics. <clears throat> well, Leonard, Leonard—I we, we, became friends with Leonard, and and actually, their manager uh, rented a room at my house for a, a short period of time, and uh, we ended up kind of piggybacking them. It was a couple of shows. One was down in Anaheim. God, where was it? Radio City Music. Radio City. Radio City is what it was called. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were the first act of a three of a three act punk show. Mm -hmm. You know, and we played, and we didn't get much notice, and we only did that a couple of times. And uh, you know, we were we really we were not a copy band. We didn't cover much. We we covered a couple of Bowie tunes, but we sort of did our set. We were really around for about two years. Mm -hmm. You know, and I realized we were hitting a glass ceiling with a man who couldn't sing. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it meant probably bad for Clint Howard, the musician, but probably good for Clint Howard, the human being, because I don't know how long I would have lived in the rock and roll world. But <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it, it's a really yeah. it, it's hazardous to your health. Yeah. But they, that I knew that I could, I always had this fallback position and that was to be an actor. You know? <laughs> right. And, right. And, and in fact, at the tail end of the band, I was actually trying to find another singer to, to replace me so I could maybe go ahead and continue kind of managing the band and maybe, maybe, you know, writing the, writing the songs and stuff, but they would get somebody that could really do it, take it to that next level. Right. And the other bandmate, Scott and Sabino, nobody else really wanted to hear that. Mm -hmm. And so right. the it wouldn't have been the band, same. I'm sorry. It's yeah. like, no, it that, is, that is a dis very distinctive quality about that band is your voice. It's like when the pistols started, and Johnny Rotten was horrified when he heard his voice for the first time. And yet that's all you think of in a lot of ways when you think of the Sex Pistols. And right. I don't know, I just, I just listened to that album the other day. And I think your voice is so distinctive that it wouldn't have been the same. Yeah, I, listen, I like it. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm a lover of music and I own a jacuzzi. And I'm in that jacuzzi <laughs> twice a day. And I'm always listening to music. And, you know, I have a go-to rotation my rotation of music is sort of odd. I will go from Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass <laughs> to Mel Torme um, to, uh, I'll tell you who I got, a got on a kick. I'm going to brain lock on his name for a second. But, um, oh, man. Well, The Who, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, the Who was absolutely magical. But there was a fellow, Nielsen. Um, oh, Harry uh, Nielsen. Harry, Harry Nielsen. Nielsen. Oh, yeah. Nielsen. Sure, Nielsen. yeah. Harry Nielsen was really special and did great, great music. I also was a fan of Tommy Boland too. And Tommy Boland, guitar player that played for Deep Purple, a couple of, one album and Janis Joplin. And, and he ended up dying of a heroin overdose, which is, you know, that's kind of what happens when you slam a lot of heroin. In you. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but the, my, my influences, of course it was Bowie, but oh, I don't know, once, or, once a month or once every two months, I will break out my cheap trick including that I have an unreleased CD that I finally will get around to releasing it or at least making copies and saying, Hey buddy, you want to read it? It's I'm the name of the album is more will be revealed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, and it includes some studio tunes, which we would go into a rehearsal hall that was 16 track, you know, a 16 track recording studio and just basically play live. Mm, and wow. then one time, one of our buddies had access to a four track TAC recorder, you know, which is basically the recording on a cassette, but breaking it down and doing tracks. So we built a couple of tunes that way. And, and, uh, so yes, then maybe there's more Kempsters to come. Who knows? Good. Oh, Good. Tour, that. man. Tour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
So there's Rock and Roll High School, Evil Speak. Now, in 86, you did a film called The Wraith. Yeah. And with uh, Charlie Sheen. And, yeah. And your character was kind of an interesting character, that, unlike one's... Rughead. Say, yes, Rughead, yeah. with a very <laughs> unique hair. Uh, but what was it like working with Charlie Sheen on there? Oh, Charlie and I became friends. And, I mean, we went through a 20-year period where we didn't really... We didn't see each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, but... Oh, about three or four years ago, we reconnected on a little TV movie that Sony did called Mad Families. And, you know, they asked for me. I mean, it was Charlie had thought of me to play this really goofy character. And we reconnected. And Charlie is really a good guy. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, listen, we all make choices that can be kind of funky and we pay the price for it and everything. But, you know, Charlie conquered sitcoms, which is really amazing. You have had a career as you know, a, a young leading man getting to do, you know, that the kind of things that an action hero kind of would do or whatever. He did the funny stuff, but then he landed on television mm-hmm. and he found the rhythm of doing, you know, sitcom and he really excelled at it. I mean, people may make fun of, you know, some of the things, some of the antics that Charlie did and stuff like that. But, you know, that's the one thing I told him, I mean, after we reconnected and realized in about 10 minutes that it, 20 years seemed like about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we get you know i I text him often and we see each other once in a while and he seems to be doing pretty good Mm -hmm. you know age has slowed him down enough to where i think he's you know taking the edge off some yeah um a man with a heart of gold and you know creative guy and very funny Mm -hmm. um and you know we did charlie directed two short films um back in the late 80s um, he came back from doing Platoon and he had some money and he wanted to make a 16 millimeter film because his brother Emilio had been the, had directed film. He directed mm-hmm. a Wisdom, I think is what it was called. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Charlie made a little short film and he got a friend of a friend of his that he met on Platoon, Johnny Depp. Mm-hmm. He got Johnny Depp to come <laughs> in and play a part. I had, I was the lead of the short. I got credit over Johnny Depp and we did this short <laughs> called RPG, which was really an excuse for Charlie to just blow something up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. He had learned about armaments, you know, that working on platoon. And basically I had her in the, in the plot of the show, this photo mat had done Johnny wrong and had lost some photos and I had an RPG and we went back at night and blew the son of a bitch up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And we did two of them. We, we ended up a couple, two years later, Charlie had made more money. In fact, the second short that Charlie did, he shot in 35 millimeter and probably spent a hundred thousand dollars. And back oh, then it was a fortune. Wow. Johnny had gotten on jump street and become really famous. And in fact, Charlie, chartered a jet so johnny could fly down from canada to work on rpg2 and of course having johnny depp becoming a massive tv star at the time the the credits got switched that was the first time in my life i really realized i got lapped by an actor uh, because (laughs) the first rpg was was clint howard and johnny depp and the second one was johnny depp and clint howard i'll tell you the same thing too Johnny and I, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time over the years being around each other, but for that period of time, we had a blast and he, what a sweet guy. And I know he's going through some personal stuff now and stuff, but boy, you know, that was, so that was my, that's my Charlie Sheen experience, you know, getting to meet up with the likes of Johnny and just having those adventures is cool. Well, I fig- I would figure that Carnosaur also being a Roger Corman production was a pretty quick and furious uh, shoot. But was that fun to do, to get decapitated by a dinosaur? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll tell you what, it was, it, it was. It was interesting. And the unique thing about that is the dinosaur was really only about this big. <laughs> right. yeah. um, like about, about, about a long. foot long? <clears throat> they used the old-fashioned trick of perspective. Yeah. Uh, and they, they just perspective. literally, the dinosaur would jump into, you know, foreground, right? yeah. foreground, and, and they just timed it right and shot it right and, and snapped my head off. That's amazing. You know? <laughs> and we shot, I never knew this existed. I didn't think much, I didn't think twice about chickens and eggs, but we yeah. shot in a place, there must have been three or 400,000 chickens, Wow. you know, and I mean, it was the most, it was up in Moore Park and it was the most massive facility I'd ever seen. It was just 
she indoor bigger than football fields, just hen house and oh, wow. chicken shit get poop everywhere. <laughs> oh. I mean, it it was my memory was was wow, this is really stenchy. <laughs> and of course, listen, it was all tongue firmly planted in cheek. And of course, I'm eating <laughs> chicken. My character's name was Fryer. <laughs> right. And Mike Elliott, I'm almost, I'm almost, I bet anything that Mike, Mike was a producer. I know Mike. Mike's ended up producing a couple of films that I've worked on. He produced a lot of Roger Corman's films. And he produced a movie that I did a couple of years ago called Granddaddy Daycare that I just played. I, I played a judge. I worked for a couple of days. He produced Rob Zombie movie, Three from Hell. Yeah. Um, and, and so anyway, that my tentacles, my relationships go back that far. I actually was, I actually worked for, you know, uh, one of Roger Corman's line producers. And, and uh, we always had a good time. I must have been, I must have worked on 10 Corman films. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I worked with Kelly Preston. I worked with Kelly Preston on a movie, uh, called Cheyenne Warrior. It was sad to see that she passed. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, she was real, she was sweet. But anyway, my experience with Roger, it was all the music the same. Shoot fast, have fun, don't take it too seriously. Right. You know? well, another another film made in the nineties you did, which I love. The the creature effects are so good, and that is a nineteen ninety three movie called Ticks. Oh, Ticks. Where you're the marijuana, Sick. you're like the marijuana grower and it like infects, but the, the makeup effects are great and you get, you get infected but and your face is all mutated. It's so fun. I'm infested! <laughs> I love it. That's a really fun one. And plus like the Ticks, you know, cause hallucinations in the characters. I mean, it's a really, it's a very straightforward movie, but really fun yeah. and really well made. Yeah. Well, Tony Randall, a director who was, another Corman guy. Mm -hmm. He was the one, he directed me on a couple of projects. One was a TV movie called Rattled, where I got bit by a rattlesnake. Oh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and died. And then but there was, uh, he did another one. I think he did, you know, what's the one where the, the horror guy got the, all the pins in his... Oh, oh Hellraiser. No, 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 Pumpkinhead, I think. Oh, Pumpkinhead, oh, Pumpkin, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he maybe directed Pumpkinhead. But, I think he made, made the know, sequel, because I think Stan Winston directed the first one. Right. Okay. Yeah. They yeah, made a yeah. bunch of sequels. Yeah. yeah. Don't hold me to it. I mean, I just, I know, I know that we worked a couple of times on a couple of projects, one TV thing, but you know, I was not originally hired in Tix. Really? They had, they had casting. My dad was in Tix. Yeah, and, I know. It was great. But as a sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I auditioned for something and didn't get the job. And then literally two months later, I get a call and they go, well, they're, they're doing some reshoots and they have a character they want you to play. Cool. And this was, so, so that character of Cephas or whatever my name was, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know whether I really had ever had a name. Nobody referred to me, um, <laughs> unless the ticks, you know, said said my name off camera. <laughs> <laughs> that would just be the, that would just be the pot talking. <laughs> one night, one night, and it was out in Malibu Canyon, and it was freezing. It literally was wow. freezing, and it was one of those things. I started putting the makeup on. Uh, you know, when the sun was up and we didn't finish, and when the sun was going down and we didn't finish till, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning. Wow. Um, which, listen, that's one thing. Those days may seem hard, but when you get the gratification that I've always had, when I've really, you know, really gutted it out and done something like that 24 hour day on Evil Speak or the day on Ticks. Uh, that, you know, just, just uh, very gratifying. And I was very happy with that work. And look, I know right. it's a beat. I know it's a horror movie, you know, and I've seen the movie and it's pretty good. It's not great. It's not bad. Um, yeah, it's fun. But, but, but the, the, the impression that I left, you know, and listen, it's a, it's a team effort. It's makeup. It's, it's the costuming, it's the director, it's the way the editor wants to put the thing in there. You, you know, it, this is not a solo business. This is a team business. Mm -hmm. right. And, and that team did me right. You know, mm -hmm. I look good. There's been plenty of times where I've gone and worked on things and I felt like I've given it the really good yeoman's effort and, and my work was good. And yet maybe the team wasn't quite coordinated enough. And the thing ended up being, you know, a turd burger. Right, right. Yeah, you never know. You're right. It's it's kind of like a crapshoot sometimes when it all comes together. How it's going to be, right? But you, but you know, individually, you always give it your best and hope for the best. Yeah. Now there's yeah. there's one film that you did that when you went to the movie rental place, there's a big picture of you on it, 
And we're talking about the ice cream man. <laughs> yes. And I remember seeing that and going, ugh. <laughs> I mean, because as a kid, I, I loved the ice cream man, you know, <laughs> I was one of those kids who chased after the truck and, you know, you get, you pay your dime and, and, oh uh, man, yeah, you know, ice cream man, listen, that's one thing that's the reason why the movie worked. I mean, Van Halen <laughs> did a song that it worked. You know, I mean, everybody chased after the ice cream truck. Would, Eddie Murphy had that wonderful bit that he did where he would be just, <laughs> right. ice cream oh, man's coming, yeah. ice cream right. man's coming. Yeah. And then, you know, everybody runs out into the street and, <laughs> right. and, and sweating. And by the time they get their ice cream, it's all melted and stuff. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, that was a blast doing and, uh, you know, getting, getting to add stuff and getting to, you know, have fun with it. It was a blast. I remember scaring the bejesus out of some soccer mom. We had, we had worked all night. And on nights when I was really bloody and really tired, mm -hmm. I just I told the wardrobe people and the makeup people, I go, listen, I'll just I'll take the stuff off when I get home. I'll bring it back. I want to get home. Mm -hmm. So the sun was coming up. It was, it was early morning. And I was getting ready to get off the freeway and go to my house. And I was in full bloody regalia mm -hmm. <laughs> in my car driving along. And there was this poor mom that was in a soccer van. <laughs> and she saw me out of the corner of her eye and she went like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was in the pat she was in the driver's seat and she lunged to the passenger cargo door. I saw her actually like damn near leave her feet, locking the cargo door door because <laughs> She had locked eyes on me and it was like, <laughs> you know, I didn't feel too bad because I was the one that had stayed up all night and worked on the movie. Sure. Right. <laughs> but it was like, you know, yeah, well, if I saw somebody all bloody and I had a bunch of kids in the back of my van, I probably would freak out too. <laughs> right. And, and so this character takes people to throw them into the, the ice cream fat to create this great tasting ice cream. And you actually own a prop, an actual prop that is in the movie, which is a head in a cone. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, I want to get, get a shot of that too. Yeah. There's a, there's a sequence, Clint, when you okay, actually <laughs> have two heads with the cones and you make them talk to each other. And as cool as it is, it's also very twisted. But <laughs> Is there something wrong with the fact that that looks delicious to me? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the funny thing about it, David Naughton doesn't think that's too funny. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, now, I'll tell you what. That, that, wait, hold on. That, the, no, the, right. the moment in Ice Cream Man where I'm doing the puppet show for the kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's great. I was pretty proud of that. I felt like I, I ramped that up and did kind of a funny, maniacal kind of character. And, and, you know, I don't know what some of the jokes were. It's been a long time since I've seen that movie. <laughs> Something about, you know, it looks like your head spun clean off or whatever the jokes were. <laughs> but I remember working with dad a little bit on it. I was probably 33, 34 years old at the time. And, and I knew this is, you know, a pretty good, it's a pretty good opportunity for me doing this kind of fun horror movie. And we knew what, I, I knew what it was. It wasn't a serious horror movie. Right, it was right. Of, and dad actually came to the set that day. <laughs> and not that he turned into the director or anything, but he came by because I knew I, you know, we had a lot of work to do and I was doing this thing where I was, you know, doing this puppet show and trying to create different characters and things like that. And uh, I remember at the time Norman felt like I had left a little bit of it in the bag. Like I hadn't quite done as well as I could have done on that day. But in retrospect, I've seen that scene and that's just, that's fine. I'm Jim. Oh, yeah, Daniel. I love it. You, know. you, you carry that movie. I mean, it's fantastic. Oh yeah. Uh, well, thank you. It was fun to do. Ooh, now, now nice. Clint, we've we've only scratched the surface here yes. of your yeah. amazing career, and I know that if people want to check out YouTube, there's a ton of stuff they can check out your variety show. They can check out other stuff that you've yes. done. But is there anything that you want to tell us? Is there anything that you've been working on the plug or look for in the next uh, the next year or so? Well, listen, I still have a lot of creativity left in me. I'm, I'm, you know, losing my dad a couple of years ago and just circumstance where I sort of dialed back. Mm -hmm. I, I told people, I told people that I uh, was taking a sabbatical, except I was kind of being a pussy because I, I did take a sabbatical. I just didn't tell my agent. <laughs> 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 right. But, 
I've written a thing that I would really love to. I don't think I'm too old to play the part. It's a it's a story called Where's Little Louie. It's about a former child actor who is sort of like Carl from Sling Blade, you know, mm-hmm. and, and he gets he gets discovered and and there's hell to pay when he gets brought back out into the spotlight. It's a fun little horror movie and and it's something that I'd oh. like to maybe at some point do. But you know what? I, I'm enjoying life and and doing things like that Rob Zombie's movie Three from Hell or going and doing personal appearances are, are things that you know I'm continuing to look forward to and I enjoy. I enjoy doing this. It's fun. You guys, nice. are, we we're, love it. We are so honored. And I, at some point, I need to see you in person so you can yeah, sign yeah. my rock and roll high school poster. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> We can make that happen. A cat is as long as we stay on her good side. Okay, all right, all right. We we'll can make that sure happen. Do that. He's well, a all right. Thank so, you so much. Cheers to you, sir. This has oh, been an cheers. honor. A toast of Tranya. To well, I hope you out. relish it as much as I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Time for a listener shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Wow. 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 Gentlemen, we have two new reviews. Cool. Two? Whoa, 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 yeah. Whoa, 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 what? And they're both positive. Oh, my God. <laughs> that can't be. You've I heard know. our show. How can that we're be possible? On, we're on a roll, guys. Cool. Uh, first one comes from Bigfoot Jumbo Jim. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I love this guy already. Uh, same here. <clears throat> Monster-sized love. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> ah, good. What do you get when you take four friends, mix in an undetermined amount of booze and monster conversation, <laughs> and then shake it up in a kaiju-sized martini shaker? Oh. You get Monster Party. <laughs> nice. This podcast is a premier place for all things sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. Premier. Topics, premier. Uh, their topics are vast. Their banter is vigorous, and the demon booze <laughs> lubricates it all for a smooth finish. If you, if you want to listen to a podcast that hits all the right moves, then look no further than Monster Party. And if you do, beware the full moon. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my That's God. nice That was poetry. Thanks, yeah. Mr. Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> he should write yeah. our copy. He should, be, he should write yeah. all our copy. Yeah, right. yeah. Also, this review comes from Nicolaus C., who writes, New fan. I just mm-hmm. heard about you guys from my binging of the Dana Gould Hour. Nice. Okay. I got to say, I love your repartee and genuine passion for sci-fi and horror. I love your show and now can't wait to hear a new episode every week. Aw. Cool. Well, yeah. he's a, he's a well, it's every other fan. week, but it's every other week. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Klaus, appreciate it. But, and well, maybe he you'll wants enjoy to hear it every week, is what he's yeah. saying. Yeah, right. Well, you know what he can do? He can he can go back through our library because there yeah. are quite a few episodes, over 170 episodes. So, there's okay, right. but wow. my question is, why are you mad at him? No, no, no. no th- thank you, thank you so much for listening, and I'm glad you enjoy the show. I'm just, I'm just saying. That was like a scene from The Stepfather. You you're like, you're like, who am I? Okay, who am all I? together. All right. That's awesome. Also, want to give a shout out to Sailor Lazaro Galavis from San Francisco, oh, who's now the proud, the proud owner of a Monster Party logo glow in the dark t shirt. Cool. Sailor, thank you. Now, thank now you we can see him in the dark. You're going to yeah. look great in that. Yeah. yeah. He's from the, uh, the Velvet Scream. Ah, very ah, cool. Very cool. cool. Awesome. Thank you. So it, it means that much more when someone from another podcast is actually yeah. wearing a Monster Party podcast. Yeah, so we that's really true. One, that we, yeah. one that we it's, really like, too. It's like they're, yeah. they're saying, you know, I strive to be like those guys on Monster Party. <laughs> that's what they're saying, oh, Larry. That's what? what they're saying. It couldn't be just to support us and be nice. And, <laughs> hey, this is a, that's a cool logo. And, you know, no, you have to turn it into this sycophantic fantasy. <laughs> And there are still... Well, we uh, are pretty great, though. <laughs> so, oh, see, yeah. see, the truth comes out, doesn't it? Yeah, Mr. Oh, Larry Poo. When, I, when <laughs> in reality, you're like, yeah, Larry, you're right. 
I am I am sitting in a throne right now. I have I, <laughs> I've turned the studio into a throne room. <laughs> and as I used to say in my act, I'm sitting on a throne of boys. <laughs> right. You realize when we do this, it's like no one can see if you're you're not wearing pants. Or... <laughs> no, that's true. Yes. Right. I mean, with the zoom, we only get really the it's like what is like a medium shot on. Yeah, so you let yeah. your imagination run wild. Yeah, no. From like yeah. uh, nipples down, it's all yeah. just chain mail. Or half the people, half the people on Zoom, even like on CNN, are probably not wearing b- bothering to wear pants or shoes. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking Monster of pants. Party merch. Monster <laughs> Party merch. Speaking of pants, uh, <laughs> is available on our eBay store, which is Monster Party Store, or also you can hit us up directly on Facebook. And several sizes of our T-shirts are still available, as are the Monster Party knit logo caps. Cool. Now we yeah, don't and- have pants yet. You know, no, no, no. we don't want to miss any overalls. No, we did just no, no overalls, but just the shirts and the caps, which but are very yeah, high I really quality. Would like caps. to think of how those pants would be if we made Monster Party pants. Would you have like the monster and party on two different legs, or on the butt, or on the or butt? On the like on the yeah. butt. Wait, what? What kind of pants are you thinking about? Oh, what if we do this? What if we do we? Model them after the pants in the movie so fine. I was just going to say that. Do you remember that movie? There was bare. Ryan O'Neill, like, right? right? Right. It O'Neal, was like yeah. jean, jeans, but they were like had bare just around the the, the, the pockets. The cheeks. The pockets. Yeah, the cheeks. Yeah. And it's like bare. a little, a little like yeah. see-through plastic window. Right, right. Which is genius. So kind of like a Barbarella thing. That, on that plastic is printed Monster Party. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, well, well, we'll work on that. James. <laughs> those will be Any? hot sellers yes yes <laughs> now when it comes to patreon if you are a patreon member and you buy some of our merch maybe a t-shirt maybe a cap when we send you that merch you will get as a patreon member you will get added goodies you'll get some presents from us oh my Ooh. god yes Donated by Jason Lindsay and Biff Bang Pow Toys. We'll throw oh, a couple hey, things in a box. Great stuff. So you'll get a t-shirt. You'll get some stuff. It's no extra price than the extra price of just being a Patreon member, which, by the way, is $5. Wait, wait, only $5, $5? Matt? Dollars. I, I spend more on ice cream each month. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I find $5 uh, in the crease in my gut. That's... <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's come to. So right. you could take your gut money and spend it on a worthwhile cause. Monster party. Ooh, and, yeah. and all you got to do to join is you go to patreon.com. You look up monster party, you press the join button, follow the instructions. And you're one of us. <clears throat> you that's are right. one of us. Ooh. One of us. One of us. And did you say that the, the shipping's free? Right now, the shipping's free on all this stuff, James. You, did you I say did that not, I did not. I did not say that. Well, I'm saying it then right now. The shipping is free. <laughs> thank, okay? thank you, Matt. Thank you. So the shipping is free. Wait, the shipping's free? Larry, wait, get this. Wait, are you saying the shipping is free, Matt? Okay, I got to <laughs> lay something on you. You know how shipping normally costs something? Yes. This time on our products, it's wow. free. Wow. Oh my yeah. God. I don't know how much longer this is going to last. Yeah, I mean, because really. I don't, you know, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow in the world? We might mm. need that shipping money to <laughs> buy a Bowie knife. And- <laughs> so the best thing for them to do is to jump on it now. That's right. Get them now. Get it. Right. Cool. So there you go. I would also like to throw out a kind of bonus shout out Ooh. to our good friend and uh, guest from the past, David Scow. David Scow. David Scow. David Scow. Yeah. Yes, David Scow, writer, awesome monster kid, great guy. He had edited a short story compilation uh, years ago, almost over thirty years ago, called Silver Scream. Silver Scream. Silver Scream. It's all kind of like horror short stories, all centered around like filmmaking and Hollywood and drive-ins and television sounds glamorous and, yeah and this uh this collection of short stories is being re-released now <gasps> so, wow. so look for all your fine booksellers called silver scream it's uh, short stories by clive barker richard christian matheson robert block mick garris 
all kinds of people. Wow. And this is like nice. all kind of, yeah, Hollywood themed and uh, check it out. It's uh, It's been, again, it hasn't been in print for ages and now it's back in print. Now so you can get it. For it. Yeah. What's well, the shipping on that like? <laughs> that depends on depends on where you buy it, but you'd have to check okay, that out. Okay. Yeah, but check it out. Thanks, Sean. Yes. Hey, hey, let's let's also remind our listeners that you can find us on Facebook and on YouTube at Monster Party TV. Our Twitter handle is at Monster Party HQ. Instagram also Monster Party HQ. And on whatever platform you're listening to us, please take a moment and write a review. Just like Bigfoot Jumbo Jim and Nicolaus C, we will read it on the air. That's right. And, and, and look, I'm going to go out on a limb. If, if you have something critical to say, we want to know. Yeah, sure. It's bound to happen. Yeah. We've had a good run. You yeah, know? we have. We have. <laughs> We're big boys. So somebody, we can we, take it. Somebody's nose got to be out of joint at some point. However, <laughs> if you want to give us loads of praise, I'm fine with that too. Yeah. Yeah. Like everyone else. I mean, I, I would say that if you really have a problem with us, you should probably not waste your time writing something. You should just listen to another podcast. No, 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 no. They should listen to ours. And, and, and hate it. No, no. no. <laughs> so Send it's us. hate listening. That's interesting. <laughs> no. I don't, I don't think that will ever happen with our podcast, to be honest. You, never, no. hey, you know, there's somebody who's like, oh, those guys rubbed me the wrong way. And I'm, you know. But I would say just move no. on. But but no, you you want to hear it, Larry? I get it. You want to <laughs> look if there's something rubs them the wrong way. We have a slew of other topics that we talk about. I have Maybe. a feeling it won't be about topics. <laughs> right. It's certainly not about us. Oh, in our how could oh, you ever think over that? each other? Oh, yeah. oh That's, yes. because you know why? Because we're a party. We're the monster party. That's right. That's why. Do you yeah. remember in the early days? Because there, there is a couple negative. Not they're not even that negative. They're just uh, no, a little critical. No, yeah. no, no. And, and it was fine, and I get it. And one of the things was, you know, it's like, well, we're trying to jump on top of each other. It's like, well, hey, pal, if you want to listen to a strict interview, hi, tell me about your career. Fine, go, go and do that. When, like that we, we, you know, we're like, we're, <laughs> we're not necessarily fast and loose, but but it's like at a party, you know, we're it's a monster party. party. Yeah. A little we're bit having fun. a little bit, ooh. a little bit, wah, a little bit, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a geezer. Yeah. We're just watching the fast show. So, uh, fast, fast show character. Yeah. Someone sitting there, mate. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but I understand that maybe, especially in the early days when they weren't sure what they were listening to, the idea that there were four guys, and maybe every once in a while we would talk over each other. But that's really the only – we don't know how to do this show really any other way. So the idea that we're going to get somebody's going to come in with like what I think you should do. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I yeah. know what we should do. We should try to let each other speak. But sometimes we can't because we're <laughs> assholes. But also, <laughs> no, because we're so enthusiastic and we can't, we can't control our yes. love and right. energy and enthusiasm. Passion. That's, that's, passion. that's it. That's what it is. And that's we're assholes. Right. No, no, no. There's no assholes in this group. But but I you know what? I thought That's, for this That last might be the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> for, this, for this last interview, I thought we all did a wonderful job. Yes, yes. No, it was that was a it joy. Was, it was that was yeah. It was awesome. I mean, the the uh the thanks go to Clint Howard because yes. he was <clears throat> yeah. just class act. Just love. Oh yeah. Total professional. On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I am Sean Sheridan. I am Larry Stroth. And I am James Gonis. Keep America strong! Watch anything with Clint Howard. And now, try on your shots! <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I just want to introduce you to the rest of my cohorts here. Hey, oh, Clint. cool. Larry is the guy who was your point man, I guess. Oh, okay. That's, that's Larry Stroth. And then we got Hold James. On, I'm, wait, wait. I'm taking a chair. I'm going to switch around here. Oh, I see. I got a threesome now. Yes. Sean. Hey, Larry. How you doing? There's Sean. Yeah. That's Sean I'm Sheridan. doing great. 
He's got Those all the going. action figures in the background. Yes, okay. inclu including this guy. Oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you probably I have can't. several I, versions of that. Yes. I, you know what? I'll tell you what. I've got something for you, too, that I'll share. And hold on a second. Hey, babe, could you go get the uh, Star Trek? Oh. And by yes. the way, and then we got James in the corner. And uh, okay. okay, wait, hold on. I see Matthew. I see Sean. And I see, hold on. Let's see. I see James. Hey, hey, James. Hey, Hey, thanks for being here. Yes. Oh, cool. You know what? I don't really have the technology to throw all of you guys up on on one screen. I no think if I get lucky and swipe across here. Okay, I've got – I'm sorry, James. You better be loud because I can't. <laughs> That's okay. No it tends to be kind of a, you know, a chatterbox. So. Oh, my gosh. I'm ready. Sometimes we can't get him to shut up, you know. Yeah, really. Oh, my God. Where is it coming from? Uh, it's in the house. It's in the house. Yeah. Real quick here. Well, wait. Are we starting or, or are we? Are, no, no, no. Yeah. Right Not just now yet. we're just chatting. And by the way, oh, yeah. since we, we usually what we do is when we do these episodes, we'll do a little chat up front. If it's okay with you, we like to put – some of that on the end as like a little kind of a bonus thing. It's just, it's just, just us chatting. That's all. Oh no, no, of course. I, I, you know, b podcast B roll, so to speak. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. Yeah. Well, well, I'll give you, I'll give you a little, well, first of all, since, since it's out, since commander Baylock is out, I'll give you oh, a oh, oh my gosh. Nice. Now is I that paid big money made? for that. Is I that like an, is that like an official thing or just a custom made for you? You made that, right? I made this. Oh yeah, my gosh, I, that's I, awesome. Don't you this, know about his one, fascination with snow globes? That's yes. right, yeah. Really? This one is uh, over five years old. And you know, eventually, listen, the one thing about these <laughs> snow globes is is uh, they're living and breathing things and and I say that because, you know, when you start mixing glue with water, there's an interesting <laughs> chemical thing that happens and it breaks down. And if you notice, the puppet is hanging on by one thread. The puppet did not end up moving oh, wow. at the beginning. Oh. But right, anyway, right. I've been doing this for... That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've been doing that for, oh, I don't know, uh, five, six years now. And it's That's really great. fun. I've done, I've probably done at least 25 or 26 of them. There's only been one that rest in peace. And, <laughs> um, um, but the others have held up really well. And it, it all stems from just my sense of humor or what I'm feeling at the time. I mean, that was the first one I did. And I had the little <laughs> figures that came from the Star Trek doll. Game. Right, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, the Playmates ones. Yeah. Yeah, there was Shatner. And then there was me and there was the puppet. And the problem is, is for me to get Shatner into the, into the globe, I would have had to have put him, I would have had to have had him on his knees. And I, <laughs> there was just something that, that just didn't quite sit right. Yeah. Yeah. Captain yeah, Kirk is on that, his knees. In that Bay for Lock. fan fiction. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I've done I, I've done a few that have been sort of political in nature, and I did one called "Jumping the Reservation," and it was a guy that looks an awful lot like Landy Quaid, um, <laughs> <laughs> hurd hurdling a barrier, uh, giving the salute to the uh, to, to the people watching. I've done a couple of Grinch ones. Oh, cool. I, gave, <clears throat> I gave one Grinch to my brother, and then I kept one, and uh, I did. Anyway, listen, I could go on and on because I love it. <laughs> no, no, no. You're no, in good I company. Want, I just want to hear about really good company. Yes. Yes. Did, your yes. did your brother go, what, what is this? Or did he go, oh, this is fantastic. He loved it. Right? I mean, I, he oh, loved no. it. I'll tell you what. It was, it was cool. I've made a couple for Ron, and I've made one for Cheryl, and it made her cry at Christmas. Wow. Um, oh. it was, I, got a, I got a matchbox. I got a matchbox Volkswagen. And, you know, my brother and his wife fell in love when they were in juniors in high school. Mm -hmm. And Ron's yeah. first car was this Volkswagen. And um, <clears throat> Cheryl has always called their life a wild ride. Mm -hmm. And so I got the idea. I got the Matchbox car. I painted it the right color. I had the right interior. I put a couple of little figures in, in it. And I had it going over, going up a ramp. This is inside of the snow globe. It's going up a ramp and it's breaking through a barrier. And the title of it is A Wild Ride. Nice. Oh. That's awesome. And, yeah. And with Ron, I did one where I got a Grinch action figure 
And I posed him and, of course, sealed him with glue and then clear coat. I mean, that's the trick is you just put you put tons of product on right. these things and almost right. make them a, almost make them acrylic. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I posed the Grinch holding a big oversized check like a like a guy winning a bowling <laughs> tournament or a guy winning a golf tournament. <laughs> right. He's yeah. holding Max is at his feet and he's holding the check and he's saying the Grinch is saying. See, Max, I told you the little girl mentioned something about a check. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, an ongoing line you know, that, that the Grinch said, and it was an ongoing kind of line between Ron and I on the set of the Grinch, because I was on for several weeks, many weeks working there in Whoville. Mm-hmm. And as absurd as it got, as crazy as it got, as fantasy as it got, you know, and because you know, The Grinch was not the kind of movie Ron was sort of dreaming of making when he was 16 years old. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. so, but anyway, as the spectacle as this is, but you know what? We're all making a lot of money on this. I mean, I, you know, there was, it, was, it was a healthy summer for me financially, and I know it did Ron really well. And as absurd and crazy as it got, Ron would walk by me every once in a while and say, I think the girl mentioned something about a check. <laughs> it's a little inside little inside brother thing so anyway i did that and then one which is one and he's got both of them back at his house in uh, greenwich and it was probably the best one i've done i wish i could show it off i don't have it with me but it's it's a guy directing a scene in the middle of a snowstorm and i built a guy i built a cameraman and i built a camera and it's a guy directing and he's got he looks like Frank Capra. I mean, it just looks like a guy in a blizzard. Like a cl- directing. classic director guy, yeah. And it's and the name of it is There's Time for One More. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron has been notorious for working until you can't shoot anymore. You know? oh, right. oh, time for one more. So he's got that. He's got that right next to his Grammy in his oh, office. That's beautiful. Nice. <laughs> well, that's great. And that's are most awesome. of these, do you make most of these like kind of just for yourself or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, they're not for sale. Although, if somebody offered me, my, like I, I jokingly say, the sale price is two hundred and twenty thousand dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and for that, I will Uber the son of a gun right to your house. <laughs> oh, we'll, I don't we'll start a pool. In, I don't yeah, care right. if in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> We're all gonna do like we're gonna do a GoFundMe, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. we'll get there. <laughs> and my philosophy as a businessman is you only have to sell one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. That's right. I've, gi- I've given a few away. And so anyway, it's, it's, That's awesome. know, it's, a, it's a lovely livelihood. And I quit playing golf out of health reasons and stuff about 10 years ago. And, and this gives me something to do in the garage and it's fun. And, um, you know, <clears throat> We're kindred spirits. I mean, we're all, we've, you know, yeah. like little kits and all kinds of stuff. And we're no, yeah. we're yeah, no let's be, let's behind me. super glue and Dremels. And, you know, oh, there you, okay. You guys are geeks too. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. come on. We all have huge collections. We're not, a, yeah. we're not a bunch of clowns here, Clint. Let me tell you. Yeah, we're the, hard, oh, we're the hardcore nerds. nerds. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh I, nice. I was hoping, I was wow. hoping you had this. I was oh hoping gosh. you had this. Oh my God, this creeped me out. Look at yeah. that. Oh, that is so fantastic. <laughs> and of course, with the COVID, with the COVID, we got yes. the face shield. <laughs> yeah. because that makes sense. God sense. forbid, God forbid, David Naughton would give somebody the virus. <laughs> 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 I wish that the, the makeup effects in that movie are really good. Like yeah. they're really, the, the, the heads on the, the, they're all really, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this no, is no, no, no. It, it, well, Mark Garbarino was responsible, and he was the same makeup artist that was responsible for Edward Edward Penis Hands. <gasps> oh, that's, the, that's the porn version of Edward Scissorhands. Oh, don't, okay. don't yeah. pretend. Don't pretend like you don't know what it is. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I finally watched the. I finally watched the film um, <laughs> with my bride, and it was actually kind of underwhelming. Um, Mark's work was better later in his career when he did Ice Cream Man. It seemed right, like right. that the, the, the it just didn't quite work right. But you know that was directed that was directed by the same guy that directed Ice Cream Man. Oh, oh really? Oh wow. my gosh! Yeah, okay. yeah that, and okay. that's Mark Garbarino was a young makeup man. That that hold on, David's had enough airtime. Um, <laughs> 
Mark, Mark Garbarino, uh, young, ma- young makeup effects guy uh, on the Ice Cream Man. Well, he was even younger, and the way he broke in was he was cheapest available to do this. Right, right. But, sure, and, sure. and Norman Epstein, who in, in the porn world was Paul Norman, uh, was and he is a he is a wonderful wonderful dude, and him and I have struck up a friendship that's lasted a long time, and you know it, it is a kick to you know know a guy who's directed five thousand pornographic films. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, you know, and he tried, friend. He he tried to direct. And he did. He directed a few kind of sem, semi straight. I think mm-hmm. he did a Caligula movie and. Um, Edward Penis Hand was a porn, but it actually did. It had a plot, and they had a guy actually playing Johnny Depp's role, and he, you know he was mugging it up pretty good. You know, <laughs> acting in those pictures and never quite top flight. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> right. um, but it, that was a wonderful experience because you know there was a lot of the crew, a lot you know the people around the movie. They had all, all been in the porn world, and and Norman had earned the right through his investors and stuff to let's make a straight movie, you know? Right, right. And he made this, he made this kids horror movie, which he realized in retrospect, those are two genres that don't really mix. In, right. In truth. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause if you make it, if you make a horror movie, like you should, kids shouldn't see it. And if right. you make a movie that's kid friendly, it ain't really a horror movie. True. Yeah. True. Right. And, you know. and Clint, this, and this is all so great. And I'd love to have this on the show. Let's do it. And, and, let's and I know, anyway. I know. Let's, you're, the, let's you're start officially. At, Cat yeah. has just been so lovely and so wonderful, hooking everything up here. And I, I, I want to, you know, make the most of your time that we have yeah. you. We're so just we're going to cool. do our intro. We're going to do cool. our intro. And it, what we do is we do kind of like, it's like a horror movie host kind of intro. And then, uh, very short. And then we introduce ourselves. Larry is going to introduce you and the topic, which is you. And then we're yeah. just going to talk. Yeah. And, and then we'll, we'll go to, we'll go to the- town. Now, do you think you've got good B-roll on the snow globe, or you, would you like me to bring it back into the broad, uh, program? <laughs> uh, I can do. I can do a screenshot of it, actually. Oh, that'd be good. There you go. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah actually, we, uh, there you go. Yeah. If you're set, you're, yeah. I'll give it to you front and center. We can get rid of anything. If you guys want to, you know, go back over any, ooh, look, he's about ready to go. <laughs> oh, my oh, yeah, God. Right. Oh, yeah. oh, my By God. a thread. Hanging by a thread. There's space between. Okay, here we go. Here you go, Sean. Okay, hold Come on. on. Say, say something, Clint, so I can get you, so your video comes up on my screen. Commander Baylock, Corbinite Maneuver. Okay, here we go. There hold it was. Pose for a for second. Searching for the Tranya. Searching for okay. the Tranya. All right. That's a good time. Cool. Let me get one more. Hold on. Uh, there you go. What? Right. Yep. This is good. Hold on. This is it. Perfect. Hold, hold. Awesome. Thank you. Beautiful. Great. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. Cool. cool. Well, okay. Well, listen, you know, go All back right. and revisit anything we've been talking about. Perfect. All right. Okay. Nice. All right. So let's, let's do this then. So, so Clint, we're going to do this. I'll introduce you, and then we'll go to town. Here we go. Cool. Okay. Before before we wrap this up, I just want to say a few years back, I saw you at the Handy Market on Magnolia. <laughs> <laughs> How great they is that? They were a grocer since 1963. <laughs> How great is that barbecue? Oh. oh. It's- it's tip top. It is. I'll tell you, Handy Mart is a great, great little market. A guy named Alan still runs it, and uh, the barbecue is great. I actually shot a little short film. It was a guy's student film. A friend of mine, Guy Nolan, he made a student film as he was graduating Northridge um, about a um, a guy sort of oh, what, how would you say a, a, an old guy taking advantage of a young guy. Okay. In, a, in, a, in a way of stealing his wallet and telling him a story and then saying goodbye to him. And we shot it at a handy market. It's a great, it's a great little short. I'll tell you what, it's that short that Guy Nolan made called Danny Boy. It's available to be viewed on YouTube. Okay. And anybody, right. anybody who's interested in, in kind of seeing me do one of those kind of underground character kind of things. And mm-hmm. it's very easy to watch. There's nothing, you know, it's not, it's not evil speak or anything like that. <laughs> it's, it's relatively easy on the eyes. And it's something that me and a good friend of mine, uh, Gabe Damon, he, his name is Gabe Lavezzi. As a child, he was an actor and he went by the name Gabriel Damon. Uh, he was in Newsies and he did a voice in Land Before Time as a child and we were really good friends. We met circumstantially and, and became friends and we worked on this, uh, this short film and it's available on YouTube and it's called Danny boy. And I'm proud of it. And well, also too guys, I mean, you guys mentioned handy market or whatever. I don't know exactly where you guys are, but you know, 
through email or whatever, and to get something signed or whatever, we can rendezvous somewhere. That's no oh, problem. Sure. Oh, that'd be awesome. awesome. Thank well, you. I, I, maybe, maybe after all this blows over. Yes. 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 Right. I, I do yes. not need an excuse to go to Handy Mart and get some barbecue. Let's get that uh, <laughs> a tri-tip sandwich. <laughs> Oh, uh, we can run even what those smoked turkey legs are pretty much the bomb either. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh no, I'm all over. All right. I'm walking distance to Handy Market. Okay, awesome. I'll see you in ten minutes. Okay, <laughs> Clint, thank all you right. so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Clint. Much, Clint. Yeah, that's cool. That was it. That was great. That was great, yep. guys. Again, like the fact doing this podcast, this is to me the best thing about this podcast. Yeah. We just we just oh, talk. Oh. We just talked for an hour and a half with Clint Howard. Yeah. See, I, yeah. I was I was gonna say yeah. the best thing was our friendship, but well, yes, that's <laughs> it. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. It's really fun. No, no, it's really you, really you know what I mean. Good Howard. Okay. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean. Hey. But yeah, no, because the best thing about our friendship, no, late. is getting Clint <laughs> Howard. Now we're on that note. So right. We have to do it some kind of Tranya thing, or mm -hmm. on that. Um, note, uh, watch the films of Clint. Ha watch all the films of Clint Howard. Yeah, yeah. Watch Clint Howard and everything you can. Because um, you can't make, avoid him anyway. Or, or, or oh, this would be weird, but how about like and, and wow. listen to and listen. <laughs> no, and, no. I mean, he's in, look, 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 look. Even if you don't know who Clint Howard is, you've seen Clint Howard. I mean, yeah, he's yeah. In all yeah. the Austin Powers movies, everywhere. It's yeah, he's like, everywhere. Yeah, I love him. He's watched awesome. Clint Howard movies. In fact, you are probably watching one right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. That's, uh, I, I feel like something a little more. Yeah, or you, uh, or you could end how about it like, somehow with "I hope you relish it as much as I." Well, there's that. As much as us. I mean, Listen the, to Monster Party. I hope you relish it as much as us. Is that there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, how you? So, uh, it, America Strong. Watch anything with Clint Howard in it, or watch Clint Howard films. I hope you relish them as much as I. As yes, us, us. Is that correct grammar? I hope you relish yeah. them as much as we? us. Well, we. No, us. We. Right? Hope, hope you relish. We, we we technically I think is correct, but it doesn't sound right. What's that was us? This is, be us. This is always I that say us. I can ask. This is always that thing that's always. I can ask the English oh, I know. in the other room. Oh, or you, you can say start changing the the. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. It could be, I, hope, I hope you relish it as much as we do. Right. Relish them. I hope you relish them as much as Monster Party. You could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nope. On that, that note, that Larry, still fits as a. Larry, yeah. don't save this. Don't then write a <laughs> review of this meeting. Did Larry so, go ask? No, I will if you want. But I, I mean, is is it? Well, here, here's the thing, though. Since he did the, since he did his own thing at the end of that relish, maybe we should. Kind of hitting it, it again. Maybe, how about this? How about I mean, this is a little, how about? And remember, right. listen to Monster Party now, an affiliate of Eagle Bauer Enterprises. That's brought right. to you, brought to you by Eagle brought Bauer Enterprises. Yeah, I mean, I said a pom know. poms. Yeah, something like that could be good. Know, Larry doesn't like this. He's um, never seen the movie, and he doesn't care about anything that us. Or how about how about we something about predicting the future of Monster <laughs> Party? <laughs> um, I, I mean, we have to keep it simple. To like, listen, watch Ron Howard and every, watch <laughs> Clint Howard. Ron, I keep saying Ron, Ron. Howard. <laughs> Uh, listen to Clint Howard. And oh, that would be great. Watch Clint Howard and everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and watch um, all of Ron Howard's films. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, how about some with Evil Speak then? You know what? Watch, I have watch no out for demonic boars. What are you? What are you gonna say, Larry? <laughs> I was going to say I have no problem with uh, Matt going single and and saying uh, you know watch all Clint Howard films. I uh, I hope you relish them as much as I. I don't mind you being alone. That, doing that's it. fine. Sure. My only thing is that he said it himself. Yeah. He, when or how he about just make a joke about Tronia without saying the the quote? Like just say bring bring you know get some more Tronia out here or um you know bring in the Tronia keg or something you know something like that. Well, here's something to think about. I know you guys say that he makes the comment and then it'll be too soon, but it's like when he makes it, then we have all our business. I know, I know, but but, but, you, can't really, but you can't really top him himself saying it. You know what I'm saying? Okay, it's, it's I like, gotcha. Um, I gotcha. Uh, well, and for our toast, we also mentioned trying it. So that's I don't right. Know that's yeah, true, so. I think that's the obvious thing. And we're going to do that in our, you know, we're going to do that in our postings. We're going to mention trying right, it. So right, right. it's like, let's do something different. Maybe some. I'm just trying to think. But like evil speak, we talked a lot about evil speak. Is there something that's like 
one of his most prominent starring horror roles, you know, or the ice cream man. I don't know if it's that quotable quotable, though. What about the ice cream man? Or like, uh, do you guys um, realize that there is a a metal lunchbox of gentle Ben and he's on the main face, but there is no Andy Griffith lunchbox really oh. i wanted to bring that up and i was wow. gonna say yeah. oh you ever look there's at your no brother andy, there's no andy griffith lunchbox period no there really? isn't that's yeah. interesting well because it wasn't really considered a kid's show yeah, yeah. i mean yeah you're right yeah spend jump to ben was a big hit with kids right so. i mean th- i mean there is a there is an action figure of ron howard from happy days right james there, it, oh, uh, yeah. oh yeah there's Migo. Migo style Migo. yeah right yeah, right yeah. Migo ones. but I mean, they. I know more of the little Belloc figures were made th- from Playmates, so right, that, yeah, that yeah. Great. Those guys, yeah, these guys are fantastic, man. These are yeah. good likenesses. And see, yeah. mine are still mine, are, cool. mine are still in the box. I hey, you know, so is mine. Really? Oh, Ooh. See, you know why? Why? Because I like the diorama the setup. The setup oh, yeah. is so neat. That's true. It's That's it's true. funny, Matt, because I had always hoped to get him on the show at your place and have him sign, and right, you know, he'll do it. Yeah, it's we'll see. Like we'll eventually get that. Yeah, all it's going to cost us is like a barbecue sandwich, I guess. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, uh, now that I'm thinking about that barbecue sandwich, that's all I want right now. <laughs> I'll have to try that. It's I'm so great. I like Ooh. a good barbecue, you know, chicken. Well, they must be open for takeout, right? Yeah. Probably. Uh, yeah. No, that's a great, that's a great business to, because the, the barbecue is outdoor anyway. Mm-hmm. Perfect. All they got to do is social distance when you're there. Oh, hey, so. hey, how about, I don't know, is this too weird? How about this? How about, um, isn't, you know, watch everything with Clint Howard and don't try, uh, don't try turning off this podcast or it'll explode by Corbomite or something like that. We have Corbomite infused in the sound waves of our podcast. <laughs> Any deviation from listening will <laughs> cause an explosion. It will kill not only the aggressor but also uh, i i love your enthusiasm on (laughs) (laughs) you have never been so delightfully wrong how about just like trying you for everyone and like don't have to make the quote we could just like say yeah maybe it's something as simple as that yeah Matt. it's like, it's like watch every what's a phrase uh, all, you use when you're all, drinking watch like, yeah. howard films and trying you for everyone and let, the, and let the tranya flow freely something like that Ooh. there you go sure how about okay all right so then how about this then all right so we do yeah watch anything with clint howard and now trying your shots Yes, that's it. <clears throat> Perfect. And, and, and you know go, what? Yeah, Ma- yeah, Matt, then when you try to shot, we go, woohoo! Yeah, yeah. Ah, and then we die. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wish I, do, I wish I could do his laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should do the laugh. Like, you're good at that, Matt. What if we all, can we all try to do that same laugh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> count three. <laughs> One, two. We're going to go on count three. <laughs> okay, okay, go. Three. One, Two, three. Ah! <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's good, good enough. That. Yeah. Trying to show, I like the trying to show. Yeah, that's good. Now, now that's we what isolate uh, James's track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> that's not bad. Bad. Because that's what he does. In, that's what he does in the Shatner Rose. He's like doing shots of Tronya. Yeah, that's fucking that's hilarious. True. I he know. Does, so he good. does two shots and then he throws the glasses. Yeah, yeah. I know. And, and he look- he's got like a he's got a, a two yeah. funnel. Yeah. It's, so great. it's so good. And then I love him talking about how Shatner uh, is afraid to show that he has a bald head. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not ashamed of this. Yeah, you've got a you've got a Wookie on your head. And then no, he, no, says, he says you've got a Wookie snatch on your head. Wookie yeah. Wookie yeah. snatch. Oh. That's, a, that's so freaking funny. You know, you know what bugs me? Space you know humor. Me? You know what bugs me about that roast? If you watch it, when you watch Shatner. And he has a smile on his face. He's not like going, oh, that's the thing that pisses me off. It's like, where's the laugh at yourself? Cut loose, man. I, well, I mean, yeah. oh, wasn't it? Who was it? Who We had somebody, I forget which guest, who either was Aaron at the Lee. roast. Yeah, remember he was, somebody was saying that they were kind of like Shatner's Writer. guide, for, right-hand man for the thing. Yeah, and Shatner thought that, he had explained to Shatner that Shatner has to be quiet through the whole thing until, and then at the end, he has to, he can insult all the people. But he thought he was going to be like, 
talking and kind of interrupting and oh, the people as how they're doing the roast. Been, how long has he been in the business? He's never yeah. heard of or seen a roast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he had to be yeah, I don't know. That. See, that, see, it just, it, it's funny because watching the roast, it makes me, the, I think the people have really funny stuff. And I wanted to say to William Shatner, Mr. Shatner, you need to laugh at these. You need to laugh and go, oh, you know, it looked like you're enjoying it because that's he what was smiling. Me I mean, it's just his. No, you know, he was yeah, just, but it's, it's have you watched so it, fake. John? It's, it's so yeah, yeah. That is right. It is total fake. And uh, he's yeah. sitting there, like still, like like when George Takei does his jokes, and they are hilarious. Right, right. He's just sitting there, like he doesn't get it or doesn't understand. <laughs> right, it. And right. he thinks to me, it looks like Shatner's making it look like. I don't get the joke because it's not right, funny, right, right. which is quite the opposite. It's everything right, right. that we've learned about Shatner, which is yeah, you know, yeah. when he would describe, he'd talk about how everybody hated him. Mm-hmm. He was like, I had no idea everyone hated him because you're a yeah, narcissist. Yeah. You don't, you're right. never thinking right. about them whatsoever. So yeah, he's why del- yeah. exactly. It's true. It's right. Yeah. All, All right. right so let's do this. I, can't, I this. can't wait to get him on the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Today, Clint Howard. Tomorrow, William Shatner. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that that would be one I'd be scared of. But oh yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, we we give it a try. But I yeah. give it a try. You know what, yeah. Sean? I'd... No, we we everyone would have our notes. And if he made a short comment, yeah, uh, that was fun. And yeah. go on to the next question. Go yeah, on to the yeah. next one. Yeah. That's what you do. Although yeah. nothing would be scarier than John Carpenter. Yes, I agree. Right, I agree. I would, I would just that, start crying. That I might, <laughs> that I may have a, I might have a cocktail beforehand. Though. Yeah, yeah. 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 Take some Klonopin, you know. <laughs> philosophy? No. <laughs> well, I do that too. I, I, I usually before the show, I drink because <laughs> it's you know you, you got to be free and loose. But yeah. no, Klonopin is an anti anxiety medicine. Oh yeah, <clears throat> it's like social anxiety. It's like. If you're walking into a situation, you might take a little time. Oh, okay. It takes the edge off. But All right. Well, know that speaking of social anxiety, let's fine, finish this right. show. <laughs> yeah. All right. So well, let's end this now. Yeah. Okay. Does everybody know what they're going to do? Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, you know, uh, watch, uh, right? move, watch move, anything. Move, 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 Howard. And then. And now, and move, try on your shots. And we're going to ah. go. And then we do the laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. <clears throat> All right. Get it out. <laughs> there you go. Get get that COVID out. Here we go. <laughs> what a fucking diva. God. <laughs> Wanna powder your nose? What do you let's go? <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. On that note. I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. <laughs> What's the with you? <laughs> I'm sorry. That was that was that was a funny Weinhold. I'm sorry. I, I was doing I was doing, I was doing a, a shade of Clint Howard. I I apologize. <laughs> I, I here I'll when, do a more normal. Do, no, I, no 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 no. When you do a funny, you know it it takes me a second and I giggle. So I I apologize. <laughs> so keep keep doing that again. Now I'm ready for it. Okay. <clears throat> On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. Uh, now I can't say it. <laughs> oh. It's Weinhold. <laughs> oh, oh. I keep trying to forget. I keep, keep trying to get away from me. Okay, here we go. On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Strofe. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong! Watch anything with Clint Howard. And now, try on your shots. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. I thought we were That's supposed good. to just do the laugh. You did woohoo. <coughs> All right, I'll just do the laugh. Let's do one more take. That was good. Okay. Just the laugh? <clears throat> I'll just do the laugh. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. okay your laugh was good. Okay. Just one more time. <clears throat> Are we just doing the laugh? No, let's just come on. Okay. Okay. On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong! Watch anything with Clint Howard. And now, try on your shots!
That was good. Um, Matt, I don't know if you heard it. To me, when you first started you went on that on that note, it dropped out for a second. I don't know if that was just my audio, but you can use the other one, I guess. I didn't hear it. but Maybe, yeah. Just, you know, how it does the, it kind of winked out the audio. All right. But if you didn't hear it, then it's just me. Let's just do one more because Larry kind of laughed. Let's just do one more for safety. Okay. It's okay if you laughed. It was funny, though. Laugh. It was, no, yeah. it's good. It's good. Wait, are we not laughing? I thought we were laughing. No, no. no. I mean, you, when you when you said "Keep America Strong," you kind yeah, of giggled. That's okay. That's fine. Oh, oh, come yeah. on. But that yeah. was funny, though. Yeah, I liked it. So, okay, okay. It's fine. It's fine. You can, like I said, you can no, always no, use ha- your other, I'm happy, your I'm previous. Happy, I'm happy to do it again. I'm okay. happy to do it again. That way, that way, you have three to choose. From. <clears throat> okay, I'm ready. All right, ready? Yes. On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I am Sean Sheridan. I am Larry Stroth. And I am James Gonis. Keep America strong! Watch anything with Clint Howard. And now, try on your shots! <laughs> <laughs> good. That was good. That was a good one. That was not it's a good one. Cool. And you were all starting to do a little more of the Baylock voice. Yeah, so. it kind of kept getting yeah. better and better. <clears throat> See, you know, we massage it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. As Ron Howard says, one more, do one more. Yeah. For once, he actually got it right. <laughs> yeah. As Clint Howard, the director, says, yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, that was lovely. And uh, <clears throat> kudos, everybody. And, yeah, that was really uh, good. Thank we'll, you, guys. We'll do more of this. It's the only thing that'll keep us sane. I know. It really is. Um, God knows nothing I'm doing is working. 